Here we're set. Call to order. Uh, welcome. It is 5.30 p.m. and I call the October 6, 2020 meeting of the Historic Site Preservation Board to order. May I remind all of us to silence our cell phones, please? Roll call. May we have the roll call, please? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Member Rosenau? Here. Member Nelson? Present. Member Kaiser? Here. Member Dixon? Present. Uh, uh, Chair Burkett is excused this evening and Vice Chair um, Huff will be conducting today's meeting. You do have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, may we have a, a, a staff report, please, on the posting of the agenda? Yes, Madam Chair, the agenda for this meeting was posted for public review at the City Hall Bulletin Board on the west side of the Council Chamber and at the Planning Department counter in accordance with applicable law. Does the board have any revisions to the agenda? May I have a motion to accept the agenda? Move to accept as presented. Is there, a, is there a second? Second. So motion made by uh, Mrs. Dixon, seconded by uh, Mr. Kaiser. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I call for the question. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Raise your hand. <laughs> uh, any opposed? Okay, uh, the motion passes uh, four to four. Public comment. Uh, this time has been set aside for members of the public to address the historic Site Preservation Board on agenda items and items um, otherwise of general interest uh, within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. Although the Historic Site Preservation Board values all of your comments uh, pursuant to the Brown Act, mm -hmm. it is generally cannot take any action on items that are not listed on the posted agenda. There will be three minutes assigned to each speaker. Testimony for public hearings will be taken at the, at the hearing. Is there anyone who wants to comment on a non-public hearing item or an item not on today's agenda? Madam if, Chair, we have not had anybody asked to speak during public comment. Thank you. Uh, if there are no speakers, then we will proceed to the con uh, consent agenda. 1A is approval of the minutes. Are there any revis revisions to the minutes of the meeting of September 1st, 2020? Catherine, uh, the minutes are reported correctly, but I gave some wrong information on item 4B about the original Morito track and then the Las Palmas track. The original one, I said it was west of Via Lola. It's not, it's south of Via Lola. And the later track was north of Via Lola predominantly. So I gave the wrong direction. I'm used to a grid plan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so will you make that a motion with your corrections? Yes. Okay, is there a second to the motion with corrections? Second. Uh, Dixon. Okay, motion made by Dan Kaiser, second by Dixon. No, no, I'm I'm recusing myself. I was not at that meeting, oh, okay. so I cannot vote on these minutes. Correct. So may I have a second, please? Second. Nelson is a second. So do we have any discussion? Other discussion? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 And um, so the motion passes uh, with one absten abstention. So I, I ab Catherine, I abstain as well. I was not. Oh, okay, two, two, two abstentions and, and two uh, in favor. A motion um, passes there. <laughs> 
So next we are going to go to uh, public hearings, number two on the agenda. Uh, 2A, Jeremy Scott, owner, requesting class one, landmark historic site designation for the Arthur Elrod residence, a class three historic site, located at 2175 South Ridge Drive. May we please have a staff report? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, as noted, this is an application that has been brought in by the um, property owner. Uh, the the uh, owner has worked with the firm Robert Chattel and Associates to provide the historic resources report, which was the basis of the staff analysis and the staff report. <clears throat> In your staff report, we've identified and talked about the characteristics that are present at the um, Elrod House. And beginning on page um, uh, three of your staff report is the analysis of the evaluation against the criteria in the city's uh, historic preservation ordinance. <clears throat> uh, the information continues uh, through your staff report identifying um, uh, El, uh, Arthur Elrod is a person of significance, recognizing his contribution that was made uh, throughout Southern California as one of the preeminent interior designers from the mid-century period. Also, of course, the uh, architect of the Elrod House, uh, John Lautner, was recognized as a um, significant architect who has influenced uh, others in his profession and for the project, the building's high artistic value. <coughs> the um, the application does not uh, assert that the uh, site has uh, recognition in terms of a period of significance. However, we've noted in the staff report that the uh, house does carry uh, and exhibit many of the characteristics of brutalism, <coughs> which is a style that was popular during the late 60s and early 70s uh, in much of the United States. And I had provided for you uh, by an email uh, prior to this meeting uh, an additional uh, addenda of information that was provided to us by uh, the Robert Chattel group, um, further clarifying that detail. <clears throat> On page seven of your staff report begins the analysis of the, the site uh, for the uh, characteristics of integrity. And as you know, those are location, design, setting, materials, workmanship, feeling, and association. <clears throat> the uh, Building uh, generally exhibits strong and in, uh, historic integrity in all instances and in all these characteristics. I will bring to your attention on page seven, we did discuss the, uh, the design of the Elrod House, which is credited as a original of the construction in 1969 with an addition off the north side done in 1970, uh, excuse me, 1970. Uh, in 1971, after the filming of the movie at the house, Diamonds Are Forever, there was damage done to uh, one of the large expanses of glass that are facing west on the home, and Lautner was brought back in and designed a retractable or moving uh, glass uh, panel there that exists in the house today. <clears throat> the report notes that the Lautner designed um, another uh, uh, modification after Elrod's death in 1974, but it did not characterize the nature of that work. So although several modifications and alter uh, alterations have occurred over time, if not diminished the design integrity of the home. On page nine of your staff report is a listing of uh, the recommended character defining features for this site. Uh, obviously it's expressionistic, organic and brutalist style of architecture is the key feature. The integration of the building with its site, the uh, integration or um, blending of indoor and outdoor, the open plan, the board formed concrete textured of the poured in place concrete, and so on. <clears throat> the non-contributing features that are identified here are the landscape, the rock steps and the pathways, the iron gates across the driveway, and the sculpture pieces in various parts of the site. <clears throat> <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> so in conclusion, our staff report recommends, based on the historic resources report, that the home does qualify as a historic site under criteria two, four, and five, and retains a high degree of historic integrity. The staff recommendation is for uh, the board to recommend to the city council class one historic site designation for this parcel. This is a public hearing, Madam Chair, and uh, I know that um, the uh, representative of the owner is with us here. 
Mark Hadawi, the uh, individuals from um, Robert Chattel's office, Mr. Chattel himself, and Olivia White, who are the authors of the Historic Resources Report, are also here. And I turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. May, um, may we have questions um, for Mr. Lyon? Does any of the board members have any questions? So Mr. Nelson. Okay. Um, my question for staff is pertaining to the greenhouse and just wondering if any request or permit for demolition of the greenhouse was made. The uh, project has a building permit that's associated with it. I do not know the scope of that building permit. Uh, obviously, in the uh, historic resources report that was prepared by Chattel and Associates, there were photographs of that greenhouse. And at your site visit, which was the last week of September, the greenhouse had been removed from the site. Uh, that's the extent to which we know the details and nature of the greenhouse. Thank you, Ken. Okay. Mr. Rose now. Yeah, my question regards the physical uh, historic features, uh, specifically number eight. It says the dark gray pigmented concrete driveway. Um, when we had the site visit on Thursday, um, it's currently unpaved at this point. On, uh, on the upcoming work document that we received from the applicant, um, it's, uh, it says repour the front driveway and, and, and things like that. Uh, can we recommend that they, be, they, they go back to what the original uh, make and color and such of that of the driveways or uh, we don't really have any description of what's actually going to go in at this point. I understand. Um, what I'd suggest, Member Rosenau, is that when we come to public testimony, if uh, perhaps we can pose that question to Mr. Hadawi, uh, he can clarify what the um, owner's intent is for the reporting of that driveway and whether there's intent to do it as a, a exposed aggregate uh, or pigmented or any other type of characteristic. So let's, um, yep, let's save that question to ask Mr. Hadawi or uh, Mark, if you can expand on that when we get to the public hearing portion of it, that would be great. Are there any other questions uh, to Mr. Lyon? I, I do have a question, uh, Mr. Lyon. Um, so I remember uh, there was a waterfall at the northwest edge of the swimming pool, a, a vertical waterfall that flowed down that wall. This was behind the cantilevered uh, stairs. Um, was, was that removed? Uh, do you know anything about that, Mr. Lyon? Uh, Madam Chair, I don't know about that waterfall. Um, I would suggest that uh, perhaps we can again ask um, Mr. Hadawi to uh, clarify that feature and uh, what they had found um, at the time that um, Mr. Brown took the project over. Or, I'm sorry, Mr. Scott. Very well. So are there any other questions? Any other questions for staff? Yes, I have one, please. Yes. This is um, Mr. Lyon, John Lautner, is he the architect that is responsible for the building in Smoke Tree, the bank building that's a uh, been a vacant for a while? Um, or am I talking... thinking of a different architect? I think you may be talking about a different architect. Lautner was not involved with the projects at Smoke Tree Village. Okay. And my other question is regarding the glass wall, the glass curtain wall. Is that something in the early 70s, late 60s? Was that something that was new to architecture or was that just commonplace? You know, I would say in terms of there being motorized operable glass panels and partitions in various larger commercial buildings, it was probably something that was not necessarily innovative for its time, but certainly uh, the, uh, the, the glass retractable window that's there was obviously custom designed for this particular site. Uh, so I think you will find that there have been various types of motorized partitions, both glass and opaque materials over time, 
Um, so they're not necessarily something that was uh, one of a kind or unique to this particular site. Thank you. Are there any other uh, questions before we proceed? Any other questions? Okay, I will open the public hearing and invite uh, the applicant to, uh, to speak. So uh, whoever would like to go first, uh, please uh, state your name and address and, and tell us uh, what you would like to about the project. Who's going to go first? Um, I've prepared the applicant's presentation. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Are you going to do this sharing for the slide presentation, Olivia? Yeah, I'm pleased to. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. I was going to just do it, but as long as you've got it, I'll let you handle it. <laughs> sure. Let me, let's make sure I got it. I think I do. Okay. Okay. There you go. Okay, everyone can see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Well, good evening, board members. My name is Olivia White. I'm an associate at Chattel Inc. Historic Preservation Consultants in Los Angeles. And on behalf of the property owner, we are pleased to have nominated um, the Elrod residence located at 2175 Southridge Drive as a class one historic site. This presentation is a summary of the information contained in our application, as well as in the staff report. The Elrod residence is eligible under three of the city's criteria. Under criterion two, we believe it is eligible for its association with Arthur Elrod, who was an important mid-century interior designer in the city. Under criterion four, for embodying organic architecture with brutalist influences. And under criterion five, as a notable and significant work of master architect John Lautner. Now, in many of these slides, I've included um, photos from just after the house was constructed in 1968 as well as photos from June of 2020 um, to give you a side-by-side -side comparison. Uh, as you can see in these images, originally the uh, slate herringbone pattern tile that is present on the interior of the house continued to the exterior. Um, in June, there was a seated aggregate concrete um, pathway. Um, and as you know, there's work being done in this location now that Mark can speak more to later on. The property was listed in the National Register of Historic Places in 2016 as part of a multiple property submission uh, for residential architecture of John Lautner in Southern California from 1940 to 1994. In addition, the property was identified in the Citywide Historic Resources Inventory and assigned a status code of 5S3. Now in this 1968 photo, you can see um, that over the pool area, it's hard to see the skylights in this area, but where there are now glass skylights over the pool, um, they were originally open to the sky, which allowed rain to fall into the pool. Uh, the pool was recently restored, um, and originally, um, as Catherine described, water could flow over, over from the pool, over the steps, um, and into a catch basin, which the pool is also is going to be able to do now that it's been restored. You can also see in this image um, the Mitered glass um, was originally inset of the pool, um, and now there is obviously the curved uh, retractable uh, glass curtain wall that extends over the pool. So this is an aerial of the property. Uh, it's the first house on the second parcel on the north side of Southridge Drive, just after the gatehouse. Um, the nomination includes the 1968 main house and a 1970 guest suite and carport, all of which were designed by Lautner. The Elrod residence is defined by its irregular plan with a circular main living area pictured here with two wings that extend from it, the master suite, which is at the same level as the living room, and the guest suite, which is at a lower level to the north. The house is constructed of reinforced concrete and steel with exposed board formed concrete walls. Rock outcroppings from the site are incorporated into the structure of the house and frameless glass is set into these boulders on the north elevation. The circular living area has a shallow conical shaped roof um, composed of concrete and copper clad triangular wedges. The ceilings are clad in limed redwood boards. Some of the character defining features of the property include its reinforced concrete and steel construction, exposed board formed concrete walls, frameless glass set into the rock outcroppings, retractable glass wall, 
conical roof structure with copper wedges and clear stories, cantilevered pool terrace, frameless glass doors with side lights that open on a pivot, among many others. In these images, it may be hard to see, but on the left, uh, you can sort of see the mitered glass um, that was originally there. And then here on the right, you can see what the curved retractable um, curtain glass wall looks like when it's uh, mostly pretty much closed. The subject property was designed by master architect John Lautner, who is most well known for his modern, designing modern residences in Southern California. Lautner was a student and apprentice of Frank Lloyd Wright, who established his own pra practice in Los Angeles in 1938. He designed over 200 projects over the course of his over 60 year career. When the Elrod residence was completed in 1968, it was published in numerous publications, including Architectural Record, Architectural Digest, Los Angeles Times Home Magazine, House and Garden Magazine, Palm Springs Life, and many others. The Elrod House is one of his best known works, along with other residences in Southern California, which include Silvertop, Chemisphere, the Sheets Goldstein residence, and the Bob and Dolores Hope residence. And here on this site plan, you can see um, this dashed line shows the, the roof overhang, and this is what would eventually become uh, which would, the retractable glass wall follows the shape of the roof outline. Uh, the namesake of the residence is Arthur Elrod, an interior designer who practiced in Palm Springs from the 1950s to the 1970s. His firm had a prolific practice in the city and designed interiors of houses ranging from celebrity client homes like Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz to model homes. Through his firm's work for designing the interior of model homes for new developments, he helped people moving to Palm Springs envision what their new desert lifestyle could be like. Elrod helped define the look of mid-century residential interiors in the city as the city was growing. He was known for his use of bright colors, interesting textures, and incorporating antique pieces with more modern furniture and finishes. At the house, the Elrod House is a, is a sort of structure, it's a sculptural structure in its own right and a piece of art. And here for the house, Elrod designed um, custom furniture for the house, including curved couches to follow the shape of the living room um, and use bright colors, including reds, yellows, and oranges. And he incorporated a lot of art, um, including a commissioned a painting by Paul Jenkins, which was in the living room originally, and a mobile over the couch, which was designed by Mimi Corzana. The Elrod residence is an excellent example of organic architecture with brutalist influences. The principles of organic architecture is the merging of buildings with nature. Buildings that exemplify these principles are designed to be integrated into their sites and employ natural shapes and complex geometries. The Elrod residence's siding on the hillside, the incorporation of the rock outcroppings, its shallow form and low slung design make the house appear as though it grows out of its surroundings. The building also exemplifies some of the characteristics of brutalist architecture, including its fortress-like appearance from Southridge Drive, general lack of fenestration on street-facing elevations, board-formed concrete walls, and heavy massing. The house has seen some alterations since its construction, some of which I've already described to you. Uh, in 1970, the mitered glass in the living room was removed for the filming of Diamonds Are Forever. Um, once it was put back, it was blown out in a windstorm in 1971. To replace it, Lautner designed, designed the current curved retractable glass wall and a steel frame that crosses over the pool. In order to do this, one of the, one of the flared piers um, at the pool had to be cut off and became rectangular. In 1970, Arthur Elrod purchased the adjacent lot and asked Lautner to design a guest suite and carport for him. The kitchen was remodeled at some point, as you can see in these photographs. Um, it's our understanding that the tiger wood present on the cabinets is something that is coming back, um, but you can see the original configuration of the kitchen is mostly still intact. Um, and the slate her herringbone pattern tile, as I mentioned, that was present in the house um, that originally continued to the exterior um, was altered at some point. Despite the alterations the house has seen, um, we do believe um, it retains integrity because it continues to retain the key characteristics that make the house what it is, including its exposed curved board formed concrete walls, incorporation of rock outcroppings, 
frameless glass that is set into the rocks, its conical roof structure with clear stories, and the original configuration and layout of spaces of the house remains the same. There's rehabilitation work going on at the house now, as has been mentioned, um, and the owner's representative, Mark Hidali, can answer um, some of your questions that you may have tonight. As you can see in these two images, at one point, the, roo the roof of the house was a green roof, um, which has not been that way um, for some time. So to, to conclude, I'd just like to restate that we believe the Elrod residence is eligible as a class one historic site for its association with significant interior designer, Arthur Elrod, as a significant and important work of master architect John Lautner, and for embodying the principles of organic architecture and brutalism. So I wanna thank you all for your time. And again, myself and Mark are here to answer any questions. Thank you, uh, Ms. White, for your uh, excellent presentation. Um, that was um, excellent, we really appreciate that. Is there anyone who would like to speak um, if in this public hearing at this time? Is there anyone else? Madam Chair, we have two speakers who would like to offer testimony. Uh, first, we'll hear from Mr. Gary Johns, and then Mr. Brian Hedman has also asked to speak. Uh, Mr. Johns? Mute. <laughs> Unmute. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Gary Johns. I'm representing the Palm Springs Preservation Foundation this evening. And Nelda Linsk, a close personal friend of Arthur Elrod's, was going to Zoom with us this afternoon, but um, she got Zoomed away somewhere else. But she has authorized me to share some of her uh, feelings and reminiscences with the board this evening. Primarily, both the Preservation Foundation and Nelda Linsk 100% support the nomination and the designation and the reg uh, recognition it so deserves of the Arthur Elrod House. For all the reasons that the excellent report states, what is missing in the report, at least in the, in the amount of pages that I could get through, and there was quite a voluminous report, you all know, um, is some of, the, some of the heart and some of the soul of Arthur Elrod's living in the house. And a lot of that is really tied to the greenhouse. Nelda tells, uh, can reminisce about, and she really did wanna share this with you tonight, that, that she'd been to the house many times. She was involved with, uh, good friends with Arthur, when he used to carry the plans for the house around with him under his arm and show anyone who was interested. The greenhouse is an important part of Arthur's life there at the house. Um, the greenhouse came about because there was a rivalry between Arthur and Joe Linsk, Nelda's husband. And they had, Arthur, excuse me, Joe had a greenhouse at the house in Las Palmas. And when Arthur moved from Las Palmas to Southridge, he wanted a greenhouse too. So he had the greenhouse built. It is well designed. If you look at the photos, it's not a redwood lath uh, greenhouse. It was well constructed, built into the, uh, into the site with a concrete foundation. There is re relics of that little blue one inch tile all throughout the floor of the greenhouse. And even the potting beds are clad in blue tile. It was an important little greenhouse, though it may not have been designed by Lautner. As many of the, of the events associated with the Elrod House, the glamorous parties, uh, dinner parties, cocktail parties, all of it, the filming of a movie in the house, it was the greenhouse far from the house that Arthur could retreat to on a daily basis. And he potted there. He played classical music for his orchids and had a toothbrush, Nelda will tell you the story of how he cleaned the orchids and cared for the orchids. It was a very personal part of Arthur's life there at the house. So again, we just really support the nomination full-heartedly. And if the board with Mr. Uh, Hadawi and the group can somehow see uh, to include, even if it's just the relics of the greenhouse now in the nomination, we fully support the greenhouse being included in the nomination. So thank you very much for your time. And again, I apologize, Nelda couldn't be here. Thank you. 
Madam Chair, I stand corrected. Uh, Mr. Hedman would like to speak under item 2B and not 2A. So we'll bring him back in for public comment on that item. I don't okay. think that there's anyone else who has registered to speak on this item. Okay, anyone else? Okay, uh, seeing uh, no speakers. Madam Chair. Uh, oh yes, sorry. Now, Jade, I mean, we'll uh, have questions in a minute. Actually, um, before okay. you open it up to uh, the board to speak, I would just like to say in the interest of full disclosure that um, uh, I did contact the homeowner's representative on my own and initiated an email conversation about the greenhouse. Mm -hmm. And uh, because I had questions, because I had seen it in the photos originally, and mm -hmm. then during a site visit, it was gone. So I really wanted to know what was there and why it was demolished. I didn't really get a definitive answer to why it was demolished, but I wanted to um, disclose that uh, so that everyone is aware. Thank you. Okay. So I, I will proceed. We will have questions to the applicant, but at this time I would now close uh, the public hearing and ask for questions from the board uh, for the applicant. So are there any questions for uh, Ms. White um, about anything? Questions? I actually have one. So back to that waterfall. <laughs> mm. Waterfall edge, you know, uh, that Northwest. I did see it in one of the pictures that you showed. Um, and so I was just wondering, is, uh, is that gonna be operating? Is that something that will be uh, uh, functional? Mrs. Yes. Lyons? Yes, based on my understanding, um, it is. And Mark can describe further if you want more detail on it, um, but it's shown in, the plans that I recently saw um, to restore the waterfall and the catch basin below. Okay, so uh, so then my question is, shouldn't that be listed as a defining characteristic? Mr. Lyon, do you, would that be appropriate to have listed? It can be, yes. It's okay. not a feature that I was aware of, but I think that it can be in, um, it sounds like from what uh, Olivia is saying, and Mark, you can probably confirm this, that uh, this waterfall feature that uh, Catherine is talking about is something that uh, is gonna be reinstated at the site. Okay. Um, did you want me to talk now? Yes, okay, yes. Great. So it's not exactly a waterfall, it's a, it's a spillway. And in Olivia's picture, it shows some, you can actually see that some of, in the original picture from 1968, you can see that some of the vertical concrete is wet and other concrete is not wet. So it's not meant to continuously pump water over the edge, which would be more of a water feature. It's a spillway, which means if you go, right, the way it's, when we started the restoration of the house, which has been, you know, already over three years now and a very complicated and um, extensive sorting out of what happened to the house over time, the spillway had been, um, had been, um, uh, taken away and there was just a, a concrete uh, coping around that edge to the view side of the pool. Um, the way it's originally designed is that that tiled edge is on an angle and the water line is about half an inch from spilling over. So at the point someone were to go into the pool and move the water around, the water would get pushed over the edge and land in the catch basin below. Um, that's the way it was originally designed and that's the way um, it is again today. The pool's been put back together. It now has water in it and is fully functional. Um, uh, if you want me to speak to some of the other, I just made some notes on some of the other questions. As I said, the house, um, the house even, the house changed quite a bit in Arthur Elrod's tenure there. I think he used it much as a sort of uh, laboratory for his work, if you will. You know, the bathroom at one point was tiled, later the bathroom was carpeted. Um, and so he, you know, he changed things in the house quite a bit as he was there. He, you know, they, they had the idea to change the windows to operable windows, I think, which largely came from 
the scene in Diamonds Are Forever where Sean Connery is thrown into the pool, I, I think that that essentially sparked a dialogue between Elrod and Lautner. Since Lautner's goal was always to obscure and create the illusion between inside and outside, that the ultimate illusion between inside and outside was that there was no glass or any partition between the inside and the outside. So when that, they, they removed the glass to film that scene of Diamonds Are Forever. And I think that that sort of planted the seed to create those operable walls. So when open, there actually is no uh, partition between the inside and the outside. The, uh, the composition of the slate that is in the entryway, um, you can see in the picture Olivia showed, um, that was at one point slate, the entire driveway was slate. Um, I think that they realized that that didn't function with cars in the rain. Um, it would have been very slippery. Uh, and they later uh, changed that to a seated aggregate, um, which was then later, you know, long after Arthur Elrod's tenure there, painted black. So the intention for the um, uh, final composition of the entry, meaning the driveway and the entry to the house, is that uh, from the pedestrian gate inwards into the house would all be herringbone slate passing through to the house and that the driveway uh, down uh, the drive and into the carport would be um, seated black aggregate. Uh, what were some of the other questions? Uh, I, I can speak to the, um, to the uh, uh, greenhouse. So that, you know, I, uh, and I uh, understand, you know, the position that the greenhouse uh, was an important part of Arthur Elrod's um, tenure in the house and, um, you know, reflected his uh, uh, interest in planting. Um, there's also a seed room underneath the master bedroom, which had bins for seeds and, um, you know, also speaks to his, you know, personal interest for, for planting. The, the, um, the, I think ultimately for the client, the greenhouse, um, uh, affected, you know, the composition of the carport in a, in a negative way. Lautner designed the carport to be a freestanding structure with a floating roof of concrete. The way that the greenhouse was attached to the uh, carport, it, it, it um, took away from that uh, floating concrete roof um, because it created one whole massing at that side. The greenhouse was sort of partially um, subterranean and partially above uh, the ground. So the angled roof uh, sort of was uh, attached to the um, to the edge of the carport and built down. I think that um, uh, there are pictures of what it looked like uh, beforehand. It was actually, it was also, you know, while still standing in um, poor, uh, very poor condition. So it's the, it's the owner's um, desire to not rebuild the greenhouse and that he um, doesn't have a, um, a hobby, you know, doesn't have the hobby of planting and wouldn't, uh, wouldn't end up using it. Um, are there any other questions I, uh, for me? Does the board have any other questions of the applicant? Mr. Nelson, did you? Mr. Nelson. Yeah, um, I guess this could be directed toward uh, Mr. Hadawi or uh, Ms. White. Did I hear correctly that the herringbone pavers that were originally in the outside entryway leading up to the front door, that those are going to be reconstructed and put back? Uh, yes, those are gonna be put back. Uh, as a matter of fact, when we got to the house, there was a there was a period in about 1980 uh, when the house uh, was very difficult to sell, and uh, they made some attempts to. It's actually really interesting to see. I, I spent days uh, at the archive at the Getty going through all the Lautner um, uh, files, and most of the information in the archive exists in the form of photographs. Uh, but there's a Sotheby's, about a five-page Sotheby's brochure from 1980, 
uh, listing the house for somewhere just over $10 million in 1980. And, um, and they, they had made an attempt to sort of make it feel like a 18th century castle. They cut a huge circular section. In all the photos, you see a, uh, you see a um, Edward Fields custom carpet, um, which we've recreated uh, circular carpet um, in the living room, which the sofa is around. Um, they cut, a, a, in that same uh, volume of carpet, they cut the herringbone floor out and inset a parquet wood floor there. Uh, and that, that existed uh, when, when my client bought the house. So we removed that and infilled, matched the herringbone slate, infilled that all. And then the intention is in that same slate that we matched to that circular cutout uh, is to bring that herringbone all the way out to the pedestrian gate and then transition from that point uh, in the driveway to a seated black aggregate. Great, thank you. I have two more questions. Yep. Um, Ms. White mentioned that there was going to be a catch basin uh, under the stairs at the edge of the pool. And I know when we were there during the site visit, um, uh, staff member Lyon commented that it appeared to be somewhat dangerous that that water would spill over and get on the stairs. So if you know people using the pool and then the stairs got wet and people going up and down the stairs um i'm just curious where that catch basin is because we didn't see it when we were there maybe it's being reconstructed and it's not there yet can you speak to that at all yes so the catch basin is a is what i would call an informal catch basin there were it, it's another example of just so many things that had changed so that entire wall that you see that's the leading edge of the pool and the stairs that's all been re-engineered and re-poured. The stairs had failed, um, partially because of the water spilling on them. Now that, that it's been um, rebuilt with epoxy rebar, so the rebar won't rust and cause those stairs to break again. But the, there, there was at the time, not in Lautner's original design, but some point in the house's life, there was a ramp uh, poured, uh, added underneath the stairs to direct the water from that sort of rocky area under the stairs to a sort of makeshift catch basin. There was also a sculpture that was on that wall um, with you know, some sort of later water feature added. Um, that sculpture was something Arthur Elrod installed and um, during the time of foreclosure on the house, Lloyd's of London removed that sculpture and sold it um, to someone we don't know. Um, the idea, um, there's no uh, call out for a formal catch basin in Lautner's uh, design. And because the water that's spilling over is minimal, the idea is to um, plant that area and use rocks to create sort of an informal catch basin. Um, so yes, the stairs will get wet and there'll be some ancillary water that comes over um, when the pool's being used. But when the pool is idle, the idea is that uh, the, it's an early, it's really an early version of a, um, you know, Lautner did it at, um, at, at Silvertop um, earlier and he did it here again to kind of create this illusion of an infinity edge. And so the way that this has all been set up is that the water is at idle, just one half of an inch um, below the spilling point of the pool. So it, it appears that it's, you know, it's just falling over the edge. Great, right, thank you. And my last question, briefly, uh, was there ever any discussion between the owner and the restoration team about bringing back the living roof and why was the decision made not to bring it back? Well, there's no evidence that that was ever anything, ever any, anything but a roof with plants living on it. So I think that, you know, in a fantasy world, Elrod, you know, loving flowers and loving plants had this idea to plant those, you know, to cover that carport and, and master bedroom roof and flowers. Um, it probably was not a, um, it, 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 there really is only that one image uh, that I've ever been able to find. 
Um, so my guess is that it wasn't a practical long-term solution for the roof. Um, and, and, and so, yeah, no, there, there's been a lot of discussion. I mean, the owner's committed, very committed to going the distance with the house to do the right thing. And, you know, there was even uh, discussions, oh, I don't know, probably a year or a year and a half ago. Um, and I never felt sold on the idea, but was interested in, in exploring it with him. And the idea was that he was really curious about what it would be like to bring the glass back into the house the way it was originally. Um, the, you know, it's a little bit of a complicated conversation as these things are because so much of the house changed after the time in which the glass was changed, meaning the entire guest house was built and the circulation changed quite a bit. But we, we did mock up the old glass fenestration in large um, plexi panels um, exactly as it was and um, you know, just explored uh, that possibility, which you know, we both in the end agreed wasn't um, the way to go. But uh, you know, that gives at least you some sense of the, you know, the discussions and the, and the painstaking nature of the restoration of the house. Thank you for the detail. Sure. Are there any other uh, questions uh, from the board for the applicants? Any other board questions? Okay, well, let's move on to uh, discuss um, amongst the board uh, any other merits or comments that you would like to make. Um, any, any further discussion? Mr. Rosenau? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, just, I'm really in support of this. I, I really liked the, the, the detail of this uh, nomination. It brought together both Elrod and Lautner and and their relationship. I was especially uh, going through all the deeds and whatnot, coming across the inventory of the house at the time of Elrod's passing that, you know, listed what furniture was where, the number of cocktail glasses, the titles of books. I found that very fascinating. So uh, very good job in putting this together. And uh, yes, I will support this nomination. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Dixon. And I agree with Eric. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get to see the house and it's my loss, but I think it's a great report. I think the pictures spoke volumes of what's going on there, past and current. And uh, I'm excited that this is before us and that we're moving ahead with it. Other comments, uh, Mr. Kaiser? I too support the nomination. I think it's wonderful that the house is still here. I think having somebody love it to this point and doing this type of restoration is really great for the city of Palm Springs. So I definitely support it. Mr. Nelson. My turn. Oops, Mr. Nelson. Great, thank you. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to uh, I'll go back to the greenhouse because I think it's a really critical issue that's not been given enough attention by the Historic Site Preservation Board. This was part of an addition in 1970 that was overseen by Lautner. And while they don't have definitive proof that he designed the greenhouse, there was a subterranean structure in the greenhouse that was tied into the carport walls. I've seen the photos. And there were there was plumbing that came out from under the ground. Um, and clearly this was something that uh, Elrod asked for. Uh, it's no secret among those in the know in the preservation community that he had a great love of plants and flowers. And in fact, in his studio on North Palm Canyon Drive, vintage historical photos show in the uh, shop in advertisement and other photos that there were many, many plants, including orchids, hanging plants, lots of greenery, uh, such was the thing in the late 60s, early 70s. It was a huge integral part of interior design and certainly a hallmark of his style. Now, um, you know, people like Gary Drones and Nelda Link and so many others are names that are very well known in Palm Springs. 
And I just find it a little disappointing that we've come this far and nobody had the foresight to reach out and do a little more investigative work. Just not to, uh, you know, hamper or, um, you know, say that any of the work that they've done is uh, not up to par. It's been excellent, of course. But these little details make up the soul of a home. And Arthur Alvard was uh, very important. I mean, the period of significance is really all about him uh, as the one who commissioned the house, the one who lived in it, and the one who threw parties there and made it known to the world. And of course, Lautner is important as well. And I think Lautner also celebrated that love of uh, organic uh, composition and the owner's love of plants and greenery. So, you know, in the report, um, it shows in attachment A on page 16, an image of the glass structure of the greenhouse. And Mark made the comment earlier that um, by leaving it there it would have demeaned the floating composition of the roof of the carport. But I disagree with that because if you're standing at the pool or inside the house and you're looking out, you will see the roof of that carport and the greenhouse, uh, top of the greenhouse, is underneath the roof edge. So clearly, it was very cleverly designed to be disguised and not to stick out like a sore thumb, so to speak. It's just really a pity that, you know, the house was on the National Register and it came before the city and a greenhouse that was important to Mr. Alvard was demolished. In my view, it's a character defining feature and now it's completely gone forever. And it should have been avoided. And that's all I have to say on that. Mrs. Dixon. Um, may I ask a question of staff, please? Sure. Yes. Okay. How, were there any requirements? Was the new owner to come to City Hall or to come to the HSPB to get permission to remove the greenhouse? How was it destroyed recently? Well, as I had mentioned earlier, I am not privy or, or knowledgeable about the entire scope of the restoration project that uh, would have gone through the building department. Um, so I don't know uh, the story behind the removal of the greenhouse. Uh, Mark, uh, you might be able to shed a little more light on it, but um, I, I don't know uh, the full scope of what was in the uh, restoration project building permit plans. Well, I would like to hear from Mark, but also would the building department be able to grant permission to destroy that without coming to HSPB? Yes. Yes, this, the house is not landmarked. That's yeah, our exactly. point in being here. Yeah, exactly. So there was, it was no class at any point. This is the first step that it's On taken. the national registry, but it is not protected by Palm Springs in any way, oddly okay. enough. Okay. I would like to interject on that. Um, the class, excuse me, the house is a class three site. And for that very reason, I would think it would have triggered a staff review of the proposed demolition of the greenhouse. And I'm just curious why it didn't. It's not triggered anything in all the extensive engineering plans that we've done. We've been working on the house all permitted for the last three and a half years. There's never been any review at all. And I think that um, Jade and uh, Linda, to kind of clarify, if you look at the timing of the new ordinance, the project, as Mark characterizes, that apparently started three years ago, preceded the current uh, Historic Preservation mm -hmm. Ordinance. Uh, and at that time, uh, the house would not have had any particular standing. I, I believe, and I would have to go back and look at the 2004 citywide survey, it may have been listed in the 2004 survey uh, that was done, but that would not necessarily uh, grant it any kind of uh, procedural oversight. Thank you for that clarification. It's also just kind of interesting, if there's so much concern with the house, why did the city not um, propose its landmark status much earlier? Yeah. I'm just out of curiosity. It seems like everyone's really concerned about it now and we're the ones bringing it forward. 
Well, I, I can I, probably I can only... a little bit of question on that one. When the board, when this particular board goes through its annual work plan, uh, they do um, various parts of their work plan, which includes community outreach and education. And they often will put together a short list of projects that they would like to work on to consider uh, possible, making a possible recommendation for class one status to the city council. Um, each year that list gets vetted and the board uh, you know, looks at a, a whole city full of uh, pretty remarkable architecture. And um, you know, they, they make their own decisions as to why they prioritize things that they, they do. And, this particular one just didn't make it onto the priority. Uh, yeah, it's so interesting. I mean, in my opinion, one of the greatest houses in Palm Springs, you it know, very much is. Um, and, you know, I, I think that the city, if I remember correctly, brought forth uh, McQueen, um, right? When we did yes. that was not the client, um, right. right? Matt, that's correct. Is there any other discussion uh, amongst the board? Any other? Well, I do want to express that I'm absolutely delighted. I also agree this is the greatest house in Palm Springs. And I'm so delighted about its restoration and the conservation and the sensitivity. And um, it, I'm just so very pleased and, and thank um, the owner and, and, and you designers. Uh, great job in preserving this great legacy for uh, the city of Palm Springs. So, moving forward, may I have a, a motion, please? I'll make a motion. Okay. I will make, make the rec recommendation that uh, the, city, the City of Palm Springs Historic Site Preservation Board uh, request uh, Class 1 Landmark Historic Site designation of the Arthur Elrod Revenue uh, to be a, a designated site uh, by the City Council. Uh, located at 2175 Southridge Drive, uh, HFPB case number 64. I'll second the motion. Okay, Mr. Lyon. Um, would the maker of the motion clarify, are you basing your motion on the findings that were outlined in the Historic Resources Survey and the staff report? Sure, I would like to amend my motion uh, <laughs> to include what Mr. Lyon just stated. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so you accept the report, uh, and may I have a second? I second the report. Okay. And the motion. Okay, so we have a motion uh, by Mr. Nelson uh, and a second by Mrs. Dixon. So is there additional uh, discussion that needs to take place before we vote? Any other wonderful comments? Just. From me, just thank you to Mr. Jeremy Scott for doing all this. And yeah. I hope he gets it done and enjoys living there. Yes. And I will echo that and also say a huge thank you to uh, Mark, Meyer, Olivia, everyone who's working on the house. It really is spectacular. I mean, you can't get it all, I know. Um, but, you know, that's what we're here for. And what you're doing is so beautiful, so admirable, and this house is finally going to be the gem that Mr. Elrod always envisioned, and it's so nice that it's being brought back. So thank you all for that. Okay. So all in favor, raise your hand. Aye. Aye. Okay. Any opposed? So the, uh, delighted that the motion uh, passes uh, four to four. So thank you very much for your uh, excellent participation in this. So onward, now we're going to, on the agenda, 2B. That's the Historic Site Preservation Board uh, to consider possible Class II historic merit, historic site designation of the Palm Springs Racquet Club, a class three historic site located at 2743 North Indian Canyon Drive in Palm Springs. May I please have a staff report, Mr. Lyons? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, before I begin my staff report, I want to simply report for the record that there have been public comment letters received on this um, particular item 
that have been forwarded to the board members. And there was a uh, written uh, public comment letter provided to the board by the uh, property owner. Um, uh, Ms. Douglas is uh, here with us uh, this evening. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, also uh, have an opportunity to speak should she wish to do so. So as noted in your staff report, this project had been uh, in 2017 voted unanimously by the HSPB to recommend that the city council designated as a class one historic site. That recommendation was based on the 2004 Ash Group Historic Resources Report. Uh, the property owners had the property listed for sale and at that time had requested that the uh, city defer or postpone the um, carrying forward of the HSPB recommendation to the city council and so we did so. <clears throat> uh, because the length of the time since the ASH report has been written, 2004 until today, the city uh, initiated an updated study which uh, was uh, commissioned by Historic Resources Group out of Pasadena. That report uh, is the uh, basis of my staff report and of the analysis that's uh, part of the discussion today. <clears throat> Um, in looking at the report, <clears throat> excuse me, the report finds that the Racket Club uh, possesses historic significance. However, it lacks historic integrity in terms of it being qualified as a Class One historic site. And rather, the report notes that it is more appropriately considered potentially eligible as a Class Two historic site. <clears throat> in your staff report on page two is an overview map of the uh, Racket Club and you can see uh, the uh, structures that are still surviving on the site. Those are listed in the top of page three of your staff report. The clubhouse, swimming pool, feral residence, tennis court, 69 apartment building, seven bungalows, the shift bungalow, the unfinished condo building, and the modular construction office. Um, I love this dog. Who's got the dog? <laughs> oh, member Dixon, I love that. <laughs> Sorry. We have a new member of the board. Um, so on page four through uh, five and six is the analysis of the project based on the criteria in the city's historic preservation ordinance. <clears throat> uh, and some of these have varied from those of you who have been on the board uh, in the past where this project was evaluated. The current report has taken a different tack on some of these items and I've made comments in my staff report where those current uh, recommendations and conclusions differ. <clears throat> So the report is identified as being the Racket Club is significant because of its association with Charlie Farrell. Charlie Farrell was both a well-known uh, actor from the 20s and 30s and 40s, also served as Palm Springs mayor for a period of time, and was um, the founder, along with um, Ralph Bellamy, of the Racket Club in 1934. <clears throat> the uh, report goes on to analyze uh, the Racket Club in terms of events. And uh, while the previous reports had noted that there had been many uh, tennis tournaments and other types of things that really uh, helped promote Palm Springs around the country, this report noted that these, these events and tournaments were not uncommon to other uh, tournaments and events that were happening in Palm Springs. And as such, they were not the primary reason for the club achieving significance. So the report does not find it uh, eligible under events. <clears throat> um, Criterion two associated with persons of significance, of course, we just mentioned Charlie Farrell. Uh, criteria three is the uh, representative, it's a representative example of commercial recreational development in Palm Springs during its golden era of uh, period between the two world wars. <clears throat> as noted on page uh, six of your staff report, the racket club began as nothing more than a small tennis club uh, which began to expand as more of Farrell and Bellamy's friends joined it. Uh, it wasn't until the 1940s when the club was actually expanded uh, and uh, the, uh, um, the guest cottages were added. Uh, more guest cottages were added over time, uh, including uh, in the 1960s, the uh, Racket Club Cottages West, which was designed by notable architect Bill Cody. That complex is now separate from the Racket Club, and as you know, it's also a historic district here in the city. <clears throat> The report notes also that the Racket Club continued its significance um, through uh, the post-World War II period. And our, our report from uh, HRG identifies the period of significance from 1934 until 1969, when most of the latter uh, period of uh, major capital improvements were occurring. <clears throat> As noted in the report, Charlie Farrell was associated with the site 
from its inception in 1934 until he sold the, con and, uh, sold the club in 1959. During that time period, he did reside at the uh, club in what we now refer to as the Farrell residence. When he sold the, home in, uh, sold the club in 1959, he moved to the other structure that's also a class one site in the city that is a Farrell residence. Uh, looking at the uh, condition of the, or, I'm sorry, not the condition, but the architecture of the uh, project, uh, the report notes that there have been su substantial alterations and modifications as well as deterioration to uh, the buildings at the Racket Club. And it also addresses the question uh, next in terms of its association with Albert Frey. Uh, we know from the historic resources report that Albert Frey was credited with the design of the, uh, the bungalows. Uh, originally, I understand there were 15 bungalows uh, and the current condition, there are seven bungalows surviving and the Schiff House. And the Schiff House started life also as one of the Frey designed bungalows. Frey came back in 1961 and designed the addition that uh, is uh, projecting off the north side or the front of the house that uh, creates the um, sort of uh, um, whimsical uh, pool enclosure with the very large round skylights that makes the roof look like Swiss cheese. So um, in looking at the report and looking at the buildings and Frey's legacy of architecture, the uh, HRG uh, made the conclusion that these structures, although they were designed and credited to, the, um, to uh, architect Albert Frey, do not represent his cutting edge uh, development in desert modern architecture that he's so well known for. That these were really rather conventional structures at the time and really don't uh, reflect the, uh, the design theories and concepts that he was developing over his career. <clears throat> the report also notes that these uh, bungalows appear to have started life uh, with a board and batten and cedar shake roof um, exterior. And of course, uh, there was a site visit by the board members uh, also in the last week of September on this site. And you did note that the uh, exteriors of the seven surviving uh, bungalows in the Schiff House has now been converted to stucco with cementitious uh, flat tile roofs. <clears throat> Beginning on page eight of your staff report is the analysis of integrity. And the analysis of integrity on this site uh, is an important one. And it's part of what has differentiated this particular recommendation um, of the report and my staff report uh, from class one to what is currently being recommended as a potential as class two. And the distinction again between class one and class two are the characteristics of integrity. When there's a site that has both the criteria, one or more of the criteria, uh, persons, events, architecture, period of significance, and so on, and also has a high degree of integrity, that under our ordinance makes the site potentially eligible as a class one historic site. But when the site has a deteriorated level of integrity, the absence of integrity uh, disqualifies a site from being a class one historic site. And as you go through the staff report beginning on page eight and on nine uh, and on to nine, uh, 10, uh, the conclusion that's reached from the um, HRG report is that the site in its current condition has really lost most aspects of integrity. Uh, the landscaping is gone, many of the buildings are gone, um, you know, the, you're left with a few surviving remnants. And while they collectively convey uh, that place, which we know as the Racket Club, which is a significant element in the, uh, between the war periods for Palm Springs, the uh, current condition of the site uh, is such that the integrity has really been compromised and no longer uh, reflects what one would think of in terms of eligibility for a class one site. <laughs> Um, on page 10 of your staff report, uh, we've identified uh, what if the board chooses to uh, consider this more further, uh, buildings that would be eligible, quote unquote, uh, for inclusion in, um, in a designating or character defining features. It included the tennis court, the main pool, the Farrell residence, excluding the 1985 edition, the Schiff residence, including the 1961 edition, the seven bungalows and portions of the clubhouse that contained the bamboo room. Um, I did not mention in the staff report the um, um, Bogart Lounge uh, in that listing. Uh, 
uh, only because it, it does not represent, in, as I was reviewing it, um, a particularly unique interior. It, it sits underneath the octagonal portion of the roof, but its interior does not necessarily have any distinctive characteristics, whereas the bamboo room uh, still does have its very unique uh, interior design surfaces and, and materials. Uh, so the portions that we identified as being non-contributing were the 1969 apartment building toward the northwest part of the site, the 2005 condominium building, the modular construction office building, and those portions of the clubhouse not associated with the bamboo room, which would basically include the kitchen and those kinds of spaces. <clears throat> so in conclusion, the racket club uh, and the personages associated with it played an important role in cementing Palm Springs' reputation as a glamorous recreational destination that attracted many celebrities associated with the Hollywood movie industry. The report concludes that despite its deteriorated and much altered condition, the surviving buildings and features collectively convey exceptional historic significance. According to the report, the Racket Club is eligible for Class II Historic Merit uh, Site designation. If designated, the parcels on which the contributing buildings and features would be eligible for the application of a Mills Act contract. Now, I want to point out in this particular last sentence, the current Racket Club in its roughly 10-acre site is comprised of three parcels. And I've identified two of the three because the third parcel, which is the one toward the northwest, is the one that contains the 1969 uh, apartment building. If, that, if the board elects to recommend this thing further to city council, and you do not uh, include the 1969 building as a character defining feature or a contributing feature, that last parcel would really have nothing of any historic significance on it. And so that was the logic behind which uh, we made the conclusion of the other two parcels in APN numbers, because those are the ones on which the um, historic elements uh, still exist. Uh, that concludes my staff report, Madam Chair. This is a public hearing, and I am available to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have a question. Uh, so questions um, of the staff by board members. So uh, Mr. Lyon, was there a request for a postponement? Yes, I was going to mention that at the time of the public hearing, oh. but I will tell you that um, the, uh, the um, property owners did submit to the city, to the planning department, a request to postpone uh, today's uh, public hearing. And so um, what I would suggest is uh, if the board has any questions of me, I will answer those questions to the best of my ability. At the time that you open the public hearing, I am going to uh, guide you to uh, consider the uh, owner's request to postpone. And at that time, um, I will uh, guide you through how to process that request. But at this time, I'll answer any questions you may have. Okay. Any any other questions of Mr. Lyon? Mr. Rosenau? I've got one question for you, Mr. Lyon. On page uh, 10 of the staff report, you have portions of the clubhouse that contain the bamboo room and then non-contributing portions not associated with the bamboo room. Uh, where is the delineation there between which parts are eligible, which parts are not. The, suggest the, the suggestion there is that um, the, ba the, the building in which, the portions of the building which contain the bamboo room might be considered character defining. Those portions which include the kitchen and those other ancillary functions uh, would be proposed to not be identified. Okay. Thank you. Mrs. Dixon. Mr. Lyon, could you please go over the 1969 building and the parcel that it's on above not being included in a class two and what that means? Sure. If you go back to page two of your staff report, there's an overall map of the whole 10 acre site. When you look at that site, you will see a building in the upper left corner that is identified as building number five. That's the 1969 apartment building. In considering this nomination, the board elects to move forward with some delineation of what it believes are character defining features of the site. And if you agree with the staff recommendation 
that the 1969 apartment building is not a contributing element, then that last parcel, that northwest parcel, would not have any association with um, any kind of potential historic designation. So when you look at it, and again, it's, this is all dependent on how you choose to uh, consider this nomination and, and make your recommendations, but if you make the recommendations uh, according to the uh, recommendations in the staff report, then uh, building number five would not be character defining, and therefore the parcel on which it is located would not have any historic uh, significance related to it. Is so that does that mean that that particular parcel could basically do anything they want in the way of building? Well, it's anything that you want within the realm of what can be done in that kind of zone and with the development standards and so on that are associated with that part of the city. Okay. Okay. So they would be free to develop according to our zoning, anything that they want. And it would not have to be, it wouldn't have to look like or be any way connected to the other two parcels. It could be completely on its own. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Other questions, Mr. Nelson? Okay, just question is for Mr. Lyon uh, regarding page seven of the staff report, uh, the bottom paragraph. It talks about uh, Bishop House and Albert Bay. And my question has to do with the sentence. Uh, kind of uh, two-thirds through the paragraph that does, although past report on the Racket Club asserted that the 1961 Ship House edition were more reflective of Frey's modernist-inspired commission, the current report does not make that assertion. Before I ask you to tell us why, or to shed light on why, if you know why, um, I was there in 2004-2005, and I was there again just last week. The ship house appears to be in even better condition today because some of the remodel restoration work that was done in 2004-2005 helped to preserve it. And the interior has been even more preserved because it has been boarded up. Now, what a lot of people couldn't see when they go to the site is that the curved portion of the ship house, uh, which is currently boarded up, was originally windows. And it allowed you to see in, to see the architecture, to see that beautiful uh, Swiss cheese holy root, and to see the water and the pool, and to see the architecture. And back when I was on the board at that time in 2004, 2005, we actually got to go in and walk through it. And uh, the photos I've seen recently are from people I know who have toured the site and made an offer. So they shared with me interior photos of how it looks. And it looks very similar to how it did 15 years ago. So I would like to know why, if you can tell us, why they're saying that back then it appeared to have integrity, but now it doesn't. It makes no sense. Well, all I can do, Member Nelson, is reference page 34 of the HRG report, which is the portion that I was referencing in my staff report. And I'll just briefly uh, read this. Um, and it says, in 1961, the Schiff's commissioned Frey to design a large addition to the residence in which a porch overhang, an extension of the front bedroom with rounded exterior walls, additional rooms at the south facade, and a semicircular glass pool enclosure were added. Though the addition exemplifies certain tenets of Frey's desert modernism, the building does not appear to be an outstanding example of Frey's work. So that's where I'm getting my uh, comments in my staff report, why this particular uh, uh, researcher has made this conclusion while another researcher has made a different conclusion. I can't provide you an answer for that other than it's, I guess, professional analysis on the part of the individuals looking at it. And um, I, I haven't uh, queried that further uh, with HRG. Thank you, I appreciate that. I think it's worth looking into. And um, 
Going back to what uh, Jeff said about the three powerful, I'm pretty much in agreement, but um, I would like to point out that the of the seven bungalows that remain, only the ship house really, in my humble opinion, has any real integrity left. Uh, because it can, clearly, um, it can clearly be traced to Frey and his style that he's known for, the modernist style. Uh, the other bungalows have been so altered and changed that they don't really seem to have much integrity and they don't really contribute to the overall historic nature of the site. So I would say that Parcel 5 should not be included in a Class 2 designation. And the only part of uh, the rear southwest parcel that should be included in a Class 2 designation would be Building 7, which is the ship house, because I don't think that those bungalows um, any longer contribute to the um, historic integrity. And that said, uh, the biggest parcel with building one, two, three, four, eight, and nine, I do believe that building one, two, three, and four are worthy of class two or possibly higher, but none of that other land in that first parcel uh, closest to Indian Canyon Drive should have um, a designation placed upon it. Although I would say that maybe a pathway or um, an access point leading up to building one in the pool should be included in a designation because of that sense of arrival and feeling, um, you know, it was sighted purposely that way so that you would drive up and you would see the mountain backdrop setting and the pool was there on the left as you walked up to the building and into uh, the bamboo room and you could see it through the windows and so forth. So um, those are my comments and um, I, I don't know if it's necessary to postpone. Um, I think, you know, we've got this issue before us now, finally. Well, Mr. Nelson, the, the question of considering the postponement will happen under the public hearing portion of the uh, this hearing. So. Are there any other questions uh, at this time for Mr. Lyon before we proceed? Any other specific questions to Mr. Lyon? Okay, so seeing no further questions of the staff, uh, to the staff, I would like to now open the public hearing. And uh, I understand um, members of the board that uh, we do have a request by the property owner um, requesting uh, the postponement of the public hearing at this time. Uh, Mr. Lyon, do you want to add anything to the postponement? I want to simply uh, help you understand what the procedure or process is that you're going to go through. So this is a, this is a, a request by the uh, property owner to postpone. So what we're asking you to do is consider that request at this time, only the request to postpone. And uh, you will be asked to make a motion um, on, on whether to postpone or to reject the request to postpone. And in the event that you uh, vote uh, favorably to postpone, then uh, the matter will be the, I'm sorry, the public hearing portion will remain open, but the item will be continued to a date certain of your November meeting. Now, if you, on the other hand, reject, I'm sorry, if you, uh, if you reject the request for postponement um, through your motion, then the public hearing will continue today and the um, people uh, who wish to speak on behalf of this which I believe um, uh, Ms. Douglas would like to speak on that if it does move forward. Um, although I'm looking at all the lists. Oh, there you are, Judy. <laughs> I um, would, um, would then con continue forward. Okay. Mr. Mr. Lyon and Madam Chair, we have also had a request from Mr. Brian Hedman to speak on this item under public comment. Uh, so I'll let you take it from there. So at this time, um, I would like to entertain a motion 
to support or reject the request to postpone. Uh, may I have a motion on the property's owner's request to postpone? Anyone? <laughs> okay, gang. So we need a motion to, to either support or reject the request to postpone. Mr. Nelson? Uh, Madam Chair, I would uh, make a motion to reject the request to postpone. Okay, is there a second? So the motion is to reject the request. Uh, I'll second the motion. Okay, so we have a motion uh, by Mr. Nelson to uh, to reject the request for postponement, and we have a second by Mrs. Dixon. Is there both uh, board discussion on this motion? I would like to know the reason that the owner wants to postpone. Um, Madam Chair, um, Ms. Douglas is, is um, raising her hand. Okay, and if you want to unmute, you're, you're muted. Yes, there, hi. There you go. So um, the reason that I was asking for that is that I have two two uh, members of my team who have been in intimately involved in this program that just so happened had both have had emergency procedures and surgery uh, today. So I'm, I'm happy to speak um, and I'm here and I uh, appreciate this is very last minute, but that was the reason that I was asking for the postponement, not just to postpone. Okay. Okay, any other discussion? Mrs. Dixon? What exactly would they be able to contribute that we don't have in front of us? They have the entire history of the projects and the history of what's taken place. Um, you know, again, I'm happy to speak to the issue, but I don't have quite the same level of detail as, uh, as they do. Thank you. Any other discussion, Mr. Nelson? Yes. Um, in the past, there had been postponement before when this um, item had come up before the board. And unfortunately, the applicant, or the owner rather, have a history of um, being uh, dragging this out, and um, I really don't see any further need for postponement. I mean, we have all the facts in front of us. We've done the site visit. Um, we, uh, this board has heard this case uh, multiple times. This has been an ongoing issue now for over 15 years, and the current ownership has uh, been for nearly 10 years, and we have this on our agenda now, and we've had uh, no less than seven letters from the public, uh, including one from the owner, which is uh, a lot for a public comment received via mail or email. Um, and I believe the community and the board, uh, unless I'm mistaken, are ready to deal with this now. So that's the only further discussion I have at this time. Can I respond to that? May I? Yes. I just want to say, I think that the comment about us dragging our feet or trying to postpone is really not fair, nor, so I just want to say that, that that has never been our intention and there'd be no point to that. So. Thank, thank you. Is there any other discussion of the board? Any other discussion before we vote? Okay, we have a, a motion on the floor by um, Member Nelson to reject the request and a second by Member Dixon. Um, so um, may we um, have, uh, any, there's 
no other discussion. Can we vote on that? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Raise your hand. Aye. aye. Okay, so the motion carries four to four, uh, four to four. So um, thank you. Um, the request to postpone has been rejected. The public hearing is open. Staff, is the property owner uh, wish to, uh, you know, make address the board again? Well, in, in your public comment that I forwarded to you, uh, there was a written uh, public comment letter from Ms. Douglas, but um, I think you should direct your question to her. Certainly as the property owner, she uh, has an opportunity to speak uh, further if she wishes to do so. Okay, w would you please, Judy? Well, yeah, would it be helpful for me to read this letter because I it came in so late in this process. And again, sometimes we're not always hearing about the meetings as quickly as I had hoped. I'm not sure what happens or whether we just miss it or what, but. Yes, um, I welcome you to read okay. your, yes, welcome. Thank you. I'm Judy DeLugeshi, owner of Olivia Communities LLC and the Racket Club property. We bought the property close to 10 years ago with the expectation that the of building a condo development for the LGBTQ plus and all friends community in Palm Springs. And um, we spent many years, and perhaps we were naive when we bought it. We are not professional developers. We just thought that this would be an incredibly wonderful project to take over. Um, we spent many years reaching out to developers, going down the due diligence path with them, but it always ended up without a deal due to the requirements and concerns of doing a project built around structures that no longer held historic integrity. Uh, we inherited the property virtually as it is today. We have maintained it and followed the requirements of the city. We've fenced it. We keep fixing it when the fencing is taken down um, and do everything that the city has required. But um, about three years ago, the property was in contract with a great developer from Canada um, um, and they planned to spend close to $50 million to design and create an incredible hotel project, paying homage to the Racket Club. And I have details about that that I could share. If, uh, not, and also I included uh, the site uh, concept that they had worked on and created. And it seemed it was all going well. And then they informed me that due to the requirements of the historic board, they could not continue with the project. And this past January ended their agreement to buy. This has been, it, was, it is absolutely essential to the future development of the property, which I dearly want to see happen. Um, that the developer's efforts be supported by all and not burdened by unrealistic requirements. I am beseeching this group to take a look at what happens on that area when it has not been developed for you know, decades. Um, and please, the neighborhood and the entire community deserve the opportunity to see something terrific and great built. We truly thought this last project would be an incredible opportunity to fulfill that desire. And we ask that if you wish to place the historic designation, if you, there could be a stipulation that would be appropriate to pay homage to what this incredible place was, but is no longer, if there are ways for us to do that so that you're not encumber, encumbering the next developer from actually taking on this project. Um, the, you know, creating requirements based upon the past and not the realities of what is, make it almost impossible for us to find someone to develop the property. It, I think the fact that it's laid there for so long is that it gives us a sense of that it won't work. And I, I don't know what else to do. I mean, I've been trying to make this happen for 10 years. And Jade, I don't know what you're talking about, about somebody offering me something. But if you know somebody who wants to buy the property and wants to do something, please let me know. Um, the project 
we lost would have added so much to this neighborhood and would have paid homage to this piece of land and what it has meant to the history of Palm Springs. It is in the best interest of a developer to do that. And we at Olivia Communities would feel that all the time, money and effort spent to get a project done would not have been in vain. We ask that should a designation class two or three be recommended that it be for the purpose of respectful homage by the developer without additional unrealistic requirements. A plaque, photos of the history in a prominent place on the site would be an important commemorative for the site. What else a developer would like to do should be up to them so that we can finally find someone to build and enable the area to prosper. I have included a copy of the site plan proposal that the last developer had created so that you can see the efforts that were made and abandoned. And this has happened over and over again. And I have pleaded to please not expect what are now highly dilapidated were when I bought the property. Um, you know, we've certainly tried to board up everything. We've tried to, you know, just hold it in place so we could find someone who would take this property and develop it. The neighborhood and the neighbors deserve better. And I am so sorry that I, you know, if I had the ability and the money to, you know, to do it differently, I would do it. And I thought we could when we first took over the project, but I could not find a developer to make that happen. The bamboo room would have to be completely torn down. It is not a structure that is viable. You know, and I love that, <laughs> I love the building, but it's, it has, it, it's, the integrity is not there. I don't know how to f convince a developer that they should spend millions of dollars to reconstruct something that will, uh, I mean, the, the, the folks that we had were willing to do that. I can read a description of what they were proposing, but they were Canadians and had a really beautiful idea of making this area look beautiful and we've lost it. Yeah. We've absolutely lost it. So they have wrote to me and said, Judy, we can't do it because we've been hogtied by things that are not realistic. So I, you know, I'm sorry, but I'm pleading one more time <laughs> because I also care and I also believe that great things could happen there. But anyway. Thank you. Thank okay. you very much, uh, Judy, for your very passionate yeah. from the heart uh, uh, statement. Uh, we you. really appreciate your, your making that statement. Um, you know, this is a time for public uh, comment only, and, and there it's not a question and answer. So uh, we will have the opportunity uh, for the board to ask questions. So at this time, I wanted to know if there was anyone else who is signed up to speak on this item in the public uh, hearing. Madam Chair, Mr. Hedman has signed up to speak and his video camera is on. We would invite him to speak now. Please. Good evening, board members. Uh, my name is Brian Hedman. I am uh, a neighborhood, uh, I'm a neighbor of the Racket Club. I'm the owner of an adjoining property to the north side of the Racket Club that was also designed by Albert Frey. Uh, in 1966, it's often referred to as the Hollingsworth Tennis Estate or more recently known as the quote, hidden fray. Um, I listened to everything that Ms. Judy said. I uh, sympathize and understand and agree with the need to be commercially sensitive and flexible on this property. Uh, I want more than anything as a direct neighbor to see this lot developed. Uh, it's important to me that it be developed. It's also important to me as somebody who cares about the history of Palm Springs and, and cares about architecture and as, a, as an owner of a Albert Frey property that whatever is done is done with sensitivity to the history and to the architecture of the existing site. Um, I, I, there's a connection between my home and the Racket Club 
and obviously a greater connection between the neighborhood and the racquet club as a former anchor to the North End. And so I don't have a comment today to, you know, uh, implore the board to take one action versus another. It's really more just to thank the board for their attention and their expertise and the continued effort to push this forward and find some path and solution for the property. Um, I'm commenting because I want to see this happen in one way or another. And I, and I understand there are arguments that this, this designation and nomination would hinder the ability to sell, sell the property. Um, however, I, I also understand there are equal competing and maybe stronger arguments, I don't know, but equal arguments that an appropriate designation would assist in attracting a buyer, uh, assist in allowing the current owner or future owner to avail themselves of tax benefits, um, and to put the property to use in a way that you know, doesn't entail demolishing the entire clubhouse and building a, a, you know, a two, three-story condo complex something that is sensitive to what exists, but also commercially viable. And so, you know, I recognize this is a capitalistic endeavor. Um, I understand that uh, that needs to be considered, um, but I think that this board is doing the right thing by continuing to keep this on the radar, continuing to push it forward, and to think critically about it. So um, I just want to thank the board. I wanted to let you know, as a member of the community, I support you know, finding a responsible way forward for this. Um, and, and I hope that that happens sooner than later. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hedman. Appreciate your comments. Do we have anyone else who is signed up to speak on this item? Madam Chair, we don't have anyone else. That is not correct. This is Peter Maruzzi. I did sign up and Ken Lyon oh. is aware of it. Peter, my apologies. Go ahead. Mr. Yeah, I didn't know if my lovely face was going to appear on the screen, but I'll start speaking anyway. Uh, the Palm Springs Modern Committee that I represent uh, strongly uh, supports the Class II designation of the, of the property. And as relates to the Schiff uh, House, I think there is a case to be made that it is significant. Um, I wrote the National Register nomination for Albert Frey. And this, is, this building represents the later part of his career and has design elements that are unique to that part of his career. So I would say that that might even qualify for class one historic site designation, the Schiff House. But um, so that's, that would be the, um, the summary, the sum of my comment is that we strongly support class two for the property as the staff report recommends and class one for the Schiff House, if indeed it can be shown that it does have sufficient integrity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Maruzzi. Uh, do we have any other speakers who signed up to speak? I'm not aware of any others, Madam Chair. Okay. Hi, um, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm Ken Hall. I'm a, also a neighbor. I didn't get to sign up. Um, I did communicate earlier with uh, Mr. Lyons indicating my interest in attending today. And uh, I see I can now put my video on. Thank you. I uh, just wanted to reiterate, um, or I guess echo, the comments of um, uh, Mr. Hedman, another neighbor. Um, I live a couple streets to the north. Sorry, I own that property. I don't live there. But I, for a long time, have um, uh, wanted to see something happen at this property that respects the historical legacy there. And, um, and I've submitted, you know, comments in, in response to getting the notice of public hearings in the past. And, and it does seem to me like it's just dragged on and on. And I do hope that, um, that the board can make a decision that, um, that provides enough flexibility to attract, you know, make it viable for a developer. And, and I think the report really highlights the, the most important pieces to protect, which in my opinion are the, the, the bamboo lounge and the, and the clubhouse. I remember visiting it many years ago um, and uh, and I was interested to hear the, the comments of um, uh, Mr. Nelson regarding the, the integrity that's behind the boarded up um, ship house. So it seems like there's enough space there to um, still offer opportunities for commercially viable development that, that protects and uh, preserves those important historic resources. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Any other speakers? 
Any other speakers? Am I able to say something? It's Judy. Uh, who, oh, Judy. Uh, you have a, a short time for a rebuttal. Yes. Very it's it's not a rebuttal. I just wanted to ask, I mean, I, you know, th there's not an objection to having a historic um, designation. The question is, um, how does that impact the ability to find someone to develop the property? And I just want to make sure that that um, there's an understanding of the, both the desire to, well, are there going to be specifics? Are that you know, I mean, what is the, what would the intention be? Because that's what I, um, you know, I'm, I agree with everyone about the historical value of the, of the racket club. It's really about, well, what is it that we're going to try to maintain and what is it that we're going to enable a developer to, um, you know, properly develop a property that is this rundown. So um, I want to leave it at that. Yeah. Okay. Any other statements for the public hearing? Any other statements? Seeing no further speakers, um, we will close the public hearing. The action is now with the board. Board, is there further discussion or questions from the board for the applicant? This is time for question and answers. Mr. Nelson. Yeah, um, I would just like to uh, say thank you to the owner for being able to attend and to speak. We really do appreciate it. And uh, I read your letter earlier and I listened to it again today. And I just have to take um, disagreement with one thing and that is the condition of the property. I do remember how it looked 10 years ago and it was a much better condition than it is today. And you know that too. And the fact that there's graffiti everywhere and the bungalows have been broken into and a lot of that has been damaged and toilet removed and tile broken and so forth. It just seems that it could have been a little bit better uh, secured and uh, boarded up. On that note, I wanted to say that one of the letters we received was from the Upper West Side Neighborhood Organization saying that they strongly supported historic designation for this property. Uh, they said the historic significance is of strong interest with our neighborhood organization members, and we are desperate to see this seriously blighted property cleaned up and made presentable. Please proceed with the designation then please find a way to get the owner to make the seriously blighted property more presentable soon." Unquote. So, um, you know, having said all that, um, I think that we should let other people chime in at this point. Okay, other discussion? Anyone else? Mr. Kaiser? I have a question of Ken. Is there a way that we could put together a list of what we consider important, say the bamboo room, which has to be rebuilt anyway, the part of the clubhouse, which you would want to retain. I don't know if the pool or the tennis court, whatever the package would be, which could be relocated any place on the site, because basically everything's going to have to be torn down anyway, which would say, okay, this is what the racket club used to look like, like we have a little snapshot of it, not where it was because where it is, it's taking up a huge piece of the property and that it would give a developer a certain sense of, okay, these are the parameters that we have to deal with rather than them creating these grand plans. And I was on the board when the spa plan was presented and it was fantastic and honestly, the reaction of the HSPB was really very good. Catherine, you were at that meeting too. Yes. And the only real comments was, would you like re make the bamboo room like the bamboo room used to look, put out umbrellas with little scallops around the pool like the racket club used to look. And that was really the major criticism. So I'm really quite shocked to hear that they pulled out after that. And we were there when Mr. Choppy presented this and it was a very, very good presentation. 
And the reaction from the HSPB board was not negative. It was really very positive with a very few recommendations. So that being said, if we could come forward with something that would be like, these are the recommendations, these are important things, but give a developer leeway in dealing with those things, I think that that would make the property more saleable and it would allow Palm Springs to have something that would still be a tourist attraction on part of it. Will it ever be the old racket club? No, it won't. The old racket club is gone. So let's make a little monument to what the racket club was, what was beautiful about it, and make that be a tourist attraction for Palm Springs and give the developer freedom to make some money on this property. Otherwise, we're going to be doing this. I'm timed off of this board in two years. It'll be like, you know, when I go on that, like Jade does in 10 more years, you know? So that's where I am. Yeah, and um, I, I agree with uh, Mr. Kaiser. Um, if we could uh, agree with all of your comments and if, if we could have Mr. Lyon, um, you know, give us some uh, wisdom about that. Mr. Lyon. Sure. Um, uh, did you want to, did you want to hear Ms. Dixon's question before I begin? Sure, Ms. Mrs. Dixon, before he replies to us. Okay, um, Mr. Lyon, since there are three separate parcels, do all the parcels have to be sold as one or can those parcels be divided and sold to three different developers if necessary? Um, certainly an individual parcel anywhere in the city can be sold. Um, if one were to sell, for example, one of the rear parcels that don't have access to a public street, there would need to be some type of a reciprocal access agreement across the frontage lots. But um, I guess conceptually, one could sell one or two or separately sell the lots. That would be up to uh, the potential buyer and the seller. That would not be a factor of the city. Other than so if I look the at the map that's in our packet, is that where parcel five is? Um, near San Marco Way, is that a street that's coming down that dead ends into that parcel? Just a minute. Uh, yes, that is a street that does dead end at the northerly boundary of the Racket Club parcels. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's all the questions I have right now. Thank you. Okay. Um, Madam Chair, in answer to the, or trying to clarify some of um, Member Kaiser's questions, um, when you look at a site, the way that you identify those things which are historically significant is whether we want to use the term character defining or contributing. So when you look at a site, what you typically identify are those things on the site that convey the historic significance of that site. Now, when we talk about a designation, a designation is associated with an APN number. So when we see something come in relative to a parcel on which a historic resource is located, that parcel gets evaluated and the proposed development gets evaluated relative to those components on the site which are deemed to be and identified in the resolution by the city council as being historically significant or character defined. So let's say you look at the racket club site and I wanna first make a distinction about those interior places on this site. As you know, the board's purview and authority is limited to the exterior of privately owned parcels. So the board's authority to quote unquote designate something is, is limited to those things which are the exterior characteristics. In the case of the racket club, everyone recognizes that the bamboo room is one of the most, I guess, important, if you will, or, or um, significant surviving um, components of the site. So if the board chooses to move a recommendation forward, 
with respect to the bamboo room, what your resolution would say is whatever pieces and parts of the building you were going to say are character defining. And then you would say, relative to the bamboo room, we would recommend and encourage the owner to whatever it is you want to say, preserve, rehabilitate, adaptively reuse that interior because it is recognized as one of the historically significant elements of the site, recognizing that the board does not have authority over an interior, okay? So it would be a matter of making a recommendation on that interior. As it relates to the other elements on the site, the other buildings on the site, uh, when, if you decide to make a recommendation to city council, in your recommendation, you're going to tell us what are, what you believe as a board are the historic character defining features of this site. Uh, you may say all of the buildings that are sitting there are character defining. You may say only the Schiff House is character defining. You may say the clubhouse building, that portion of it which contains the bamboo room, you know, you can parse this thing to a certain extent. Um, and then when a developer goes in and considers making a development or an alteration of that historic site, that will come back to the board for a certificate of appropriateness, as you always wind up hearing when you have those kinds of questions come forward. A class one or a class two site can be altered. There can be things taken away, there can be things added, and so on. Those elements become the instructions, if you will, um, that Member Kaiser is talking about. So you may choose to say to the City Council, we recommend whatever you want to recommend, class one, class two, um, with the following elements being what we believe are the character defining features of the site. And, and if you choose to talk about the bamboo room, and the bamboo room is one that we would recommend um, that an owner consider preserving and integrating into some type of future development. Those are the kinds of languaging that the board could consider um, as you wrestle with uh, what you want to do with this particular um, nomination. But ultimately, designation attaches to an APN. The APN, on that APN or on that parcel, there are uh, historic resources or character defining features. And that's how you make those distinctions between the two. Does that make sense? Thank you, Mr. Lyon, for giving that really wonderful explanation. That was really, really good because this is, you know, quite a dilemma, you know, the significance, but not the integrity. So it, it's really, really difficult. It, are there other uh, comments, discussions uh, that the board would like to take uh, before we move to a motion? Anyone? Mr. Nelson? Yeah. Um, wow. Here we are, finally taking a vote on this after so long. Um, it's so far with so many issues and um, what ifs and questions and doubts and you know, aspirations and hope and dreams and all these things. But I would just like to circle back to the point that without Charlie Fell, there would have been no racket club. And it was the home of Charlie Fell in Virginia, Virginia Valley. He was the mayor, we all know. Um, the pool is just as iconic as the bamboo room. It's where so many starlets were discovered where so many celebrities had famous dips and late nights by the pool and drunken conversations and whatnot. It is the stuff of lore and uh, Palm Springs myth and legend, much of which is actually true. So, you know, it's not so much about the buildings as it is about the people, the place, the setting, Charlie Bell, uh, it was his vision that allowed this place to happen. That being said, I think that the Charlie Pearl House needs to remain at least the exterior shell and be 
restored and brought back. It still appears to be in restorable condition. Uh, I still believe that the building number two, excuse me, building number one, the main building, the clubhouse and the bamboo room are um, uh, very indicative of the type and style that was so prevalent around Palm Springs in the 30s and 40s. And I think it would behoove us to require that um, in our nomination, we specify that that building be rebuilt in the exact same style with that board and batten, the wood shake roof, um, and that the elements of the bamboo lounge be preserved or brought back, uh, you know, as a recommendation. Um, I'm not in favor of saying that part of that building is significant because then you're chopping it up. Uh, so that clubhouse building is all one piece. And, um, you know, I think that you could take the inside out and have a shell to redesign it and reconfigure it the way you want it, but just making sure the bamboo lounge was in the same place. And then having your way with the dining room and the kitchen and so forth. So my, uh, my feeling is to uh, encourage uh, as many people as possible to recognize the value of building one, the clubhouse and bamboo room. Uh, item two, which is the pool, and item three, which is the Charlie Furrow house, as being the most significant thing on that parcel. Even though the tennis court is from 1969, um, it's the only one left. And the whole reason for the Rocket Club was to have tennis courts because the El Mirador tennis court became so popular there wasn't enough room to play there anymore. And that's where Charlie Phil got the big dream to say, okay, we're gonna buy this box of land and put a bunch of tennis court and have the Rocket Club. And so that's what happened. So that's the only tennis court left. So I believe that that should be a significant contributing element as well. And then uh, the only other item for me would be building seven, which is the ship house. And those are the five items, one, two, three, four, and seven, that I humbly believe should be included uh, as part of a class two designation with the possibility of further investigation uh, for the ship house to be upgraded to a class one if someone so chooses to uh, make that nomination. And I would ask you all to consider your thoughts and vote on this very carefully. And just one last comment for one of us to say that a de developer will come in anyway and tear down everything is irresponsible. And that concludes my remarks. Any other, Mr. Rose now? I I pretty much concur with Jade's comments. This is a tough one for me, but um, looking at the map, um, you know, if, if it's my understanding that if, you know, according to the report, like the 2005 condo building, we don't earmark that one, that that basically can come down pretty easily. Um, I'm a little torn on the the seven bungalows. I know it's their they're not phrase best, uh, phrase best work, but um, you know, looking at this map, also there's a lot of space there that could be transformed into something different. So I, I would, I would kind of agree now with 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 Jade's recommendations and um, and see if we can go from there. Other other comments from the board, Mr. Kaiser. I think that the main clubhouse, the parts where the kitchens were and everything else are not relevant. Those are support areas. And if those were to be torn down, you keep the front facade and you could build what you want behind it. So we'd have the bamboo room, you'd have the facade facing the pool. And they'd be free to, de to develop new kitchens behind it. I don't think keeping that whole building intact is necessary. I have no real feeling about the feral house. I don't. I don't think it looks like anything. I just don't really care. I wish the pool were more romantic. That could probably be done with 
umbrellas and stuff around it. The tennis court, I'm back and forth. The Schiff House, I would agree with. And so I think that we should be a little more liberal in the center section with the main clubhouse in the support areas, which Ken did not cite as being important either. And that's sort of where I am. Okay. Mrs. Dixon? Mrs. I have nothing Dixon. more to add. Okay. Well, I'm, you know, 100% um, keen on the ship house and, and making a recommendation to, um, uh, relative to the bamboo room to recommend to the owner to either preserve or, or recreate that. Uh, that in conjunction with the pool would be uh, a, a good solution. Um, I'm kind of neutral on the feral house, the tennis court, uh, the bungalows. So I'm most supportive of the, uh, of the ship house. I'd like to put all my money on the ship house and the bamboo room. Any other comments? Okay, so um, seeing no further discussion, may I have a motion? Someone? Jay, Jay Nelson. Okay. Um, wow. <laughs> I have listened to everyone and I've attended HSPB meeting long before this meeting and I followed this passionately and I know a lot of people in the community who followed it passionately and uh, we've all agreed uh, that it's important. So that being said, my motion would be um, to follow staff recommendation. Uh, let me just get my bearings here to um, recommend that city council designate the racket club site uh, at class two with the amendment that it not pertain to the entirety of all three parcels, but to building one, three, and seven, and also including the pool, which is item two, and the tennis court that remains, which is item four. Furthermore, I believe that the Indian Canyon frontage from the northeast corner of the property all the way to where building three ends. If you take the back of the Feral House at the southernmost tip, you would draw a line from there all the way to Indian. So basically that whole uh, northeast corner of uh, Indian and the part of the property that about San Marco Way would be um, part of the class two designation to preserve the association of feeling. Uh, so that would be the recommendation. If anyone has questions about my motion, I'm happy to answer them or to clarify it. So Mr. Nelson, would you just clarify the numbers? Um, I understood class two for, uh, for numbers one, two, three, four, and seven. Is that correct? Item number one, two, three, four, and seven, that is correct. And if somebody would like to amend to include one of the other bungalows that's considered part of the number six, uh, one of those six bungalows, I would be open to that, um, just to show that they were part of the original feeling and uh, association of the site because they did play a role in the history. I mean, a lot of the famous celebrities 
who later bought home here, stayed or lived in those bungalows prior to buying homes here. So it might be nice to preserve one of them. As far as the ship house getting a greater designation than class two, um, I think that would be up to one of our local organizations, uh, such as ModCom or PSBF, to write a nomination to designate it to a higher status. I don't think we should be concerning ourselves with anything class one at this time. Uh, does that answer your question, uh, Ms. Fox? Yes. So you put that in the form of a motion. Is that correct, Mr. Nelson? That's a motion. Um, basically, build, you know, buildings one, two, three, four, and seven, and maybe something in six that's, too, I think, maybe a little too tentative, maybe. My, um, my feeling is one of the six bungalows would be the one that's closest to um, the Pearl House. So mm -hmm. there's one, one of the six bungalows is right behind number three, the Feral House, and that would make sense because it would open the rest of that parcel up for possible development and it would be more cohesive to have a new uh, larger project back there. Okay. I'll second the motion. Okay. Uh, I, I do have a question though. I'm okay. not certain I understand the parcel of land that you talked about, Jay. I, I don't understand what, what that brings to the table. Okay, let me explain. So originally when the Rocket Club was built, there was a circular driveway, kind of a uh, crescent shaped or half moon driveway. And you would drive in one side and uh, drive out the other side. Um, so it was this sense that you were driving up to it and then you were driving away from it. And mm -hmm. um, there was a real setback. So you had this, uh, again, this, this old Palm Springs feeling, which can easily be brought back if you retain uh, that frontage as part of the designation. Uh, and just to use an example, uh, the old Desert Inn downtown, which is where, um, you know, the Rowan Hotel and the great development is and the Starbucks and all that, it too had a step back and it had a, a big driveway and it created this wonderful old romantic feeling that uh, we've lost in a lot of our old buildings. So I think it's important to retain that corner of the parcel uh, to be able to uh, bring back that arrival, sense of arrival and association feeling, if that makes any sense. Yes, uh, and I will second the motion, at which does include one of the parcels, one of the six bungalows. Any other uh, discussion? Any further discussion? I'll support, I'll support the, uh, the motion. Okay, uh, Mr. Lyon. Um, I'm gonna ask for a little clarification in your motion. Um, I would like you to, uh, if you would be willing to identify specifically which one of the six bungalows you'd like to include as a character defining feature. It makes no difference to me, of course, but I think it's important that we identify which one uh, you feel is um, noteworthy enough to, uh, to be granted the class two status. If you could do that, and then I've got a couple more questions, but could, could you clarify that one if possible? Sure, and I'm gonna ask for your help and the board's help on this, because to be honest, the last time I was at the site last week, I didn't spend a whole lot of time looking at each bungalow and studying them and their positions and the quality of each one. However, I do think it's important that one of them be uh, added to this uh, as a character defining feature because they were important. And if we're going to keep one, um, we should probably come to a consensus of which one it is. I just thought that the one behind the Pearl House made the most sense because it would free up all of that room uh, to the west and the south for the remaining bungalow to maybe be made into um, a new development or a larger building or something like that. 
if anyone has any thought as to which bungalow would be better, I'm completely open to that. I, I would uh, give a recommendation uh, that the bungalow close to the Schiff house uh, might be a better situation because there, again, is a dialogue and a relationship between the two buildings and the only buildings you know, that were designed by Albert Frey. And that little corner could be uh, defined and, and, and strengthened by having the two together. That would be a recommendation I would make. I think that's an excellent point, and I really do agree with that. So I will amend my motion that the the uh, the mm -hmm. uh, bungalow that we include as a character defining feature, in addition to the ship house, would be the one immediately to the north mm -hmm. of the ship house, uh, toward the very rear of that parcel. Okay, mm -hmm. that helps, uh, Mr. Well, so, uh, sorry, Mr. Kaiser, uh, you had your hand up? No, I was going to support what you said. I agree with this. Oh, okay. okay. So, Mr. Lyon? Uh, I want to further clarify, um, Member Nelson, on um, your recommendation on the Charlie Farrell House. As you know, the Charlie Farrell House has had a significant addition done to it, according to building permits, sometime in the 1980s. I do not personally know what part of the current structure that exists is part of the original house and i don't know what part of it was a later add-on but my question for you is in making your recommendation to include the feral house as a character defining element on the site are you talking about that portion of the feral house which is the original house excluding the 1980s edition or are you talking about the entire structure, including the 1980s edition? Great question. Can you clarify what part of it is the 1980s edition? I don't know which part is, but we could certainly probably through some forensic studies and review of possible permits, I don't know. Uh, this becomes, and I, I don't want to digress on this, but this becomes a bit of the challenge that was uh, presented to the board on a home that you uh, were uh, considering um, that was a full demo request um, in which we don't know what the original house looked like. Okay. Um, I don't know whether we have any records. I don't know if photographic records would help reveal this. Um, okay. It might. There are a lot of photos of the racket club. Maybe uh, through the process of um, reviewing um, vintage photos, it can be determined where that original house was and what part of it was then not really part of the period of significance. I might recommend that you, if you want to include the feral house, that you make that distinction and identify it as um, trying to uh, recognize uh, those portions of it that the original house, uh, excluding uh, the latter editions. Got it. Um, there is, to my knowledge, a historical photo of the Charlie Feral House shortly after it was built. I've seen it. I know that Stephen Keelan has seen it. I don't have access to the photo at the moment, otherwise I would share it. Um, I do believe that it faced uh, the pool. So what reads at the current front of it was the original front. Okay. Um, so it would make sense to me that an 80s edition probably went toward the back, perhaps, toward the, the southwest. I don't know. I can't be sure. We don't necessarily have to solve that problem, but I, what I would like to know is, and it sounds like I'm hearing you correctly, your, your desire is to recommend the original, shall we say, the original portions of the Feral House, excluding the latter editions. Correct. Okay. Uh, so long as that includes the facade that is facing the pool. Well, what if that facade is not the original facade? Okay, that's a good point. All right, so... Um, if you're interested in it, and I'm not trying to, you know, um, I'm not trying to push you one way or the other. I'm just saying that if the feral house you believe should be character defining, I would recommend that you, you sort of carve out that portion of it that's not part of the historic period, the 1980s stuff, um, and let, that, let, let the forensics of that be left to the future to figure out which part's original, which part's not. I understand. 
I understand that. My concern with that is if you if you leave out the 80th edition, then that might create some leeway for a future owner or developer to say, well, you know, I'm going to take off this part, and then they could just go ahead and demolish the whole thing. No, they can't because such an action would have to come back before the board. <laughs> Well, we know what's happened in the past. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say on that. But I, I know what you're saying, and I agree with you. Okay. So um, let's go ahead and amend the motion that it include the Charlie Farrell House, but not the 80s edition, whatever that may turn out to be. OK, I think that makes sense, uh, Member Nelson. Um, mm -hmm. I have another question now, and I'm sorry to be prolonging this, but I want clarity on this uh, so that I can make the recommendations as we carry this thing forward, if that's where it goes. Um, your discussion about the site and that portion of it, which is the front quote unquote portion of the site, um, there is currently nothing left of the site as it existed during the period of significance. It's gone. The driveways are gone, the landscaping is gone, the sidewalks are gone, the entry feature is gone, it's missing. And so any possibility of rebuilding that unless it were done based on photographs, would be conjectural. And I want to caution the board that when you're looking at the issue of what is historically significant, that there is a basis, either via historical record of blueprints, drawings, floor plans, and so on, or photographs, that substantiate that what you are um, identifying as character defining um, exists. And in this case, th those features don't exist anymore. And the next place where you can go with that, which I'm going to caution you on, but I'm going to say this, is that you're saying that the open space in that part of the site is a critical character defining feature. And I'm not sure you can really make that finding either. But if you remember many, many, many years ago, the Santa Fe Federal Savings and Loan Building, the site was significant because it allowed the perspective and the views of that particular building. If you do remember, that was a building in which all four sides had architectural significance of it. And the board identified not only the building, but also those portions of the open space around it as character defining. Same thing when you've identified courtyard buildings. You said that the open space in the middle of the courtyard is actually character defining. In the, in the identification of the historic significant elements of that site. On this one, I want to challenge you a bit to either clarify or however you want to do it, um, but the, the elements that you're talking about, the recreation of this grand entrance is, is talking about features that don't exist. And my only other caution is as we go back and talk about what Judy has talked about and what Dan has talked about, allowing a developer as much flexibility as possible to make this site viable, um, which is, I think, what I'm hearing people say is important. You're, you're saying, I'm hearing you say, this is an important site, these are important buildings, but we want to do everything we can to remove obstacles to its future redevelopment. And so, I just want you guys to sort of wrestle with that question a moment, whether you want to actually lock in that open space or whether you would like to, whether you would rather uh, leave it to the potential of um, integrating into a future redevelopment in some way that might still be open space in a grand entrance, but doesn't begin to sort of dictate those futures. Does that make sense? It yeah. does, absolutely. And I want to thank you for, uh, making all of those points and clarification. Um, and while I understand your caution, I'd like to explain why I included that land to begin with, because I thought it would give off of the interest to be uh, the, ability to, the ability or the power to better control what happens at that entrance. Um, because we all know, as other buildings have shown over time, if you don't designate some of the area around the building, they could come in with a parking proposal or uh, they could build another building in front of it or they could do some kind of landscape that significantly alters the relationship to 
that clubhouse building and that pool to the street. Mm -hmm. um, so I, the reason I included just that small fraction of land was so that when a project does come before us for review at this site in the future under a new owner, uh, that we at least have some ability to have input on how the driveway is or how the parking is. Uh, because as I understand it, if land is included as part of a designation, then HFPB does have uh, the purview to decide or to have input and recommendation to the council on how that should look. If you disagree with me totally, please tell me. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not here to agree or disagree with you. <laughs> I'm, I'm wanting to try to help you formulate this in a way um, that achieves uh, whatever the board's goals are, as well as uh, uh, leaving as much uh, open to possibility for re uh, active redevelopment as possible. The one thing that I would um, offer on this matter, um, Member Nelson, is do keep in mind that if this site gets a class one or class two designation, and a future developer comes in with a development proposal, it does come before the board for a certificate of appropriateness. And you do have the ability at that time to impose your opinions and recommendations on what that site development might be. Now, of course, you do that through the mechanism of a certificate of appropriateness. And with any uh, action and decision that this board makes, it is appealable to the city council. So I don't want to squash your uh, concern. I want to affirm your concern, uh, but I think that you can probably achieve your end goal without locking in that part of the site. That's, that's my only suggestion is, I, I hear your concern because you've seen sites in the past go through a heavy-handed redevelopment. But I think uh, you've got to have some faith in both the abilities and talents of future HSPBs, as well as to uh, entrust that this new historic preservation ordinance that we have will protect against some of those uh, problems that have happened in the past. And I believe that that ordinance uh, and the boards have the ability to do that. So I'm, I can only convey my own opinion as a staff member and it's, it's, it's for you guys to decide, but I wanna just point that out that I would suggest that you not worry about designating the open space in this particular instance, identify the buildings that you think are character defining. I would even go as far as to say, uh, and you were, I think Dan was getting at this a bit, and I've done this and also what I've recommended is quote unquote character defining. I don't, I don't personally think that the kitchen portion of the clubhouse building is character defining. I really don't. It's back of the house space. It isn't where the Hollywood stars congregated. It isn't where the kibitzing and, you know, cajoling and everything took place. Uh, that really took place in the, in the bamboo room and around the swimming pool. And to, to lock in all of the clubhouse building, including that back kitchen, um, and, and make it basically the potential to be an obstacle to future development, I think would be contrary to what your efforts are. And what I might suggest is if, if the clubhouse building is something that you believe as a building, and I'm not talking about the interior now, I'm talking about the building, is historically significant, then you should so state that. But I think if you can also be empathetic of, of a future developer um, who may want to take that back kitchen off and build a contemporary kitchen that, more, that better serves the space, mm -hmm. uh, that you offer them and allow them the flexibility to do so. That's all I'm trying to say. Okay, thank you. I do have another point in, in follow-up to that. So, mm -hmm. That being said, Ken, would you then say that 
No land around any of these buildings should be included in a designation. No, no space whatsoever. Well, again, keep in mind, a, a historic designation is attached to a parcel. So when a, when a landowner has a parcel on which there is a historic resource located, there is the potential for that open space to be modified according to a certificate of appropriateness that a future HSPB would grant. So when it comes to open space, I think you can talk about the swimming pool. I think your points are compelling in terms of the swimming pool being a, an element of significance. The tennis court certainly symbolically uh, represents the very genesis of this site. Uh, it's from what is this particular report is identifying as the period of significance. So that those two elements you could consider as, as vital open space uh, that are character defining open space, uh, if you want. Um, those are the kind of things I might look at. You know, you're, you can wrestle with, and I wanna get into the picture again, you know, something, something will happen around the Schiff House in a future redevelopment, right? And what is important about the Schiff House? You guys can only address and talk about the exterior. But when that portion of the site gets redeveloped, the assumption is that when it comes before the board for a certificate of appropriateness, the board can say, these particular views of the Schiff residents are important. These views and the ability to observe and understand that curvilinear facade of the pool enclosure is important. So at that time, when a certificate of appropriateness comes through, those characteristics can be more closely defined. Does that make sense? It does. Um, if we didn't include the ship out in this though, if um, the current owner or future owner decided to apply for demolition permit, then that would have to come before us or not? Yes. Okay, okay. That doesn't change my feelings. So I'd like to amend my motion. Um, the original motion was to include uh, item one, two, three, and seven with Sorry. the bungalow uh, closest to seven, which is the ship house. So, uh, and then I think in my original motion, I did ask for that small piece of land at the northeast corner of Indian and abutting San Marco Way to be included. I would now remove that land based on staff comments and direction. I think it's very valid. However, I would ask that the open space surrounding the pool be character defining space because in the original racket club, there was a wide area around the pool for ducking, trade lounges, umbrellas, poolside dining. So if you don't have any of that, it takes away that historic feeling. So if a developer has that space around the pool, a character defining, we can then say, okay, we want it to be recreated like it was back then, which makes a lot of sense because that's, that's where people went. They went there to congregate around the pool and there should be, I would think, at least, I don't know, 15 to 20 feet on both long sides of the pool. So that would be the west side and the east side in order to preserve room for lounges and you know, decking and tables and so forth. Staff, what do you, what do you opine about that? I, uh, my opinion is that when you, when you give it a, a quantitative number, like 20 feet around the pool, I think that gives clarity to it. And I, I, I think that that gives a developer um, a manageable set of expectations to know what he's got to deal with. Now, let's say a developer comes in 
And the character defining feature is 20 feet around the pool, all sides. And in order to make his development work, he needs to make one side of the pool 12 feet. That's a request that a developer can come in and ask a future board to approve. And a future board can then contemplate that, wrestle with it as you do, and move forward with a decision. So the short answer is yes. <laughs> Our idea of, of identifying open space, quantifying it by saying 20 feet around all sides of the pool, uh, I, I don't think is, I think is a reasonable way of, of characterizing your concern without um, thwarting or blocking or exacerbating future redevelopment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Um, uh, Mr. Nelson, I just have one comment before you come in. <laughs> um, I wanted to go back to, to building one because um, the only defining character that I see uh, with building one is, you know, the, the facade that faces the pool, you know, on the looking south. And of course, you know, the, the bamboo room, which is, you know, the most uh, redeeming element. Um, you know, we can't deal with the interior, but our recommendation is to, uh, to, to, to rebuild around, it, to have a bamboo room. So the rest of the building one, um, you know, the kitchen, the, Back, you know, the freezer, the offices, you know, all that stuff in the back is not, re, um, you know, a defining character. So can that be um, uh, stated? Okay, yeah, I agree. So um, building one, <laughs> three, and seven, the pool, number two, the tennis court, number four, uh, 20 feet to the front or east of the pool, and then all of the space from the pool going to the tennis court in between buildings one and three. So that gives you all of the surrounding pool area as character defining open space, whether it's 20 feet or less, or you know, more than 20 feet, like it could be 30 feet, who knows? But I think that is the area that makes the most sense to preserve a character defining space and I would amend that on building one we not include the back of the house meaning the delivery area the kitchen and so forth just the public access area. Mm -hmm. Okay now uh, Mrs. Dixon do you um, uh, agree? I, as the maker of the uh, I will support it I just want to make sure it's one two three four and seven. And, and, and the closest bungalow number six to the ship. And the closest right. bungalow number six. Okay. Yes. Oh. And I, I agree with all the changes that have made. Okay. Have been made. And also on the hmm? Mr. Kaiser. On the Farrell House, not including the 80s edition. Right. And on building one, not including the back of the house. Yes. Right. Okay. Right. I'm going to ask this one more point of clarification. I know you're going to start beating me up here pretty soon. We are. <laughs> <laughs> in, in the Historic Resources Report by HRG, there are two photos of the, uh, what would be the uh, southwest elevations of the clubhouse. Do you guys have that uh, information before you? No. All I want to make sure that you're aware of, and I'll see if I can maybe hold these pictures up for the purposes of seeing here. That's that's the facade of the clubhouse. Yeah. And that's the other facade. That faces the pool. That faces the pool and the tennis court. Yeah. The second one. Both of these photos are the poolside facade of the clubhouse building. And my only question for you <laughs> is, is that really what you're asking to identify as character defining? It seems to me, just 
staff's opinion. It just seems to me that that those elevations may not be the portions that you're really wanting to save or preserve because I think they're butchered. And I think that what you had characterized when you were talking about the the architectural vernacular is that it's board and batten with the cedar shake roofs. And what we evidence today on those pool facing elevations of the clubhouse is not that. It's sort of this glomp on thing that probably happened in the 70s or 80s or something um, and kind of covered up um, the original um, pool facing walls of the clubhouse. So I just want to ask the question, is that what you intend to identify as character defining or are you trying to find something else? Thank you for that. Um, in vintage punk card photographs from the 1940s, it shows that poolside facade of the clubhouse as having an overhang. So some of that overhang is very likely to be original to the 30s and 40s. I have no doubt that it was modified over the years and added on to but that's not for us to determine at this particular moment. I do believe that the round part in the rear of the clubhouse building, it almost looks like an octagon, and then it has that raised pergola bit. That is a character defining feature of the architecture and very reminiscent of what was being built around here in the 30s and 40s. So I think it's important that the pool facing side of that building, as well as the roof line, and even the Indian Canyon facing facade are the elements that are considered the character defining elements of that building in terms of the facade. Now, because the other side, which is north facing, was never really seen by the public, except maybe when you were driving down Indian and then pulling in, but that was kind of the service area where, you know, the deliveries were made and they kept dirty linens and that kind of thing. So I don't think that that is an important facade to consider. But I would argue that the eastern, northern, and the entire roof line are character defining features of that building. Do you mean the southern, Jade? Yeah. Oh, I'm. You mean sorry. the southern facade? Southern. The, the south facing pool, pool facing facade, the roof line and the east. Basically that, that pool facing facade from the period of significance. Correct. Okay. Correct. okay. Oh, wow. Any, <laughs> any other comments, discussions? We have a motion and a second on the floor. And if there aren't any other further decision, discussions, uh, I'd like to, um, to call for a vote. So all in favor of the motion, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? So uh, the motion is approved for uh, four to four. Four to four. Yay. We deserve a medal for getting this far with this project. This is great. Good. Okay. So the next item on our agenda is number three, it's unfinished business, which there is none. So next is new business for A. So for A is, um, is the Paul Nahapali Jr. and Michael Martin, who are owners, requesting a certificate of appropriateness for oh. all three. Madam Chair, I'm sorry to interrupt you. You do have an item oh, for A, which is the um, Pearson residence. Uh, oh, I skipped. I'm sorry. I'm so I did skip that. I'm so eager to. Uh, uh, I'm so eager to move on. I'm sorry. I skipped that. I beg your pardon. Okay, for uh, a. <laughs> so um, so uh, Roswitha Kima Smale, owner, requesting Class One historic site designation of the Henry Pearson residence located at 573 North Kauia Drive. Uh, I understand there's uh, not a staff report on that. 
So may I make a motion to receive the historic resources report under separate cover and direct staff to schedule site inspections by the board and to schedule a public hearing to consider that application. I made the motion. Uh, may I have a second? Second. Uh, Mr. Rosenau, second. So Huff, motion, Rosenau, second. Is there a discussion about the, this residence? If there's no discussion, then we'll call for the vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 And anybody opposed? So uh, the uh, motion passes uh, four, two, four. Now we are going to proceed to item 4B. So uh, Paul, Nahapali Jr. and Michael Martin, owners, requesting a certificate of appropriateness for alterations to the Goodlow residence, also known as the Casablanca Adobe, located at 590 South Indian Trail. So may I have a staff report, please? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> um, as noted in this particular application, the homeowners are requesting a certificate of appropriateness for alterations to a class one historic site. The scope of those uh, modifications are the uh, installation of a natural stone uh, driveway and pathways uh, leading up to the existing garage and to the existing front entrance of the home. Uh, the installation of a new pedestrian entry feature at the corner of the property and the uh, construction of a small outdoor fire pit and seating area adjacent to the front of the house. The recommendation from staff on this is that you grant the certificate of appropriateness for the project as proposed. And our analysis of this, I'm not going to go into detail on this at this point, but what we have found as we've evaluated the project against the findings in your ordinance is that the project does not materially impair the character defining features of this site. And that the work that's being proposed is harmonious with the character of the home. Now, we talk about the addition of, of alterations to a building whether they are to be done in such a way according to the Secretary of the Interior standards that they are visually differentiated, or those that are actually restorative or done to replicate or continue the existing aesthetic. When an applicant does that, and when the city's HSPB considers this type of alteration, it's important that it be documented in the archival file so that when a future board or commission has been asked to make further modifications, that these elements that are being potentially approved here today are not misunderstood as being historic because they're not. They're additions that have been done in the contemporary period, but they're done to be harmonious with the site. And that's the manner in which we feel that this project does reflect uh, and is consistent with the Secretary of the Interior Standards. So our recommendation is that you approve the certificate of appropriateness for this project. We're available to answer any questions. And the, um, the gentlemen, Paul and Michael, are here to answer any questions that you may have of them. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lyon. So are there any questions of the staff? Uh, before we invite our applicants to make a comment? No. Any, uh, Mr. Nelson? Um, I don't know if there's an appropriate question for staff, but um, I remember the property before it was designated and it was always open and very visible. And um, the owner, before the current owner, put in the bougainvillea hedge, which completely shields the house. Although you can still see the house from the front gate where the plaque is located. 
if we approve this new corner entrance with this adobe wall and this big tall double gate you will no longer be able to see the house and it will be completely changed from the original plan and the original intent so how do we justify that because basically for the period of significance and for the majority of the life of this home you could see all of it and what good is the historic site with the plaque if you can't see any of it? You know, why are we allowing you all of- Be careful of that, there's a lot of cars you can't see. <laughs> so that's my, my one point to staff is that the, again, it's the association of feeling, the original context of the setting, that was a very um, kind of um, informal neighborhood, so to speak. And it was very open and casual. And part of that whole uh, experience in that tract at the time it was built was the open air Palm Springs lifestyle. Granted, it's a very different city today. It's uh, no longer a small village or a town and it's built up. But if we allow this, we're no longer able to see the house from the street. Did you want me to respond to that? If you like. In considering the corner feature, we looked at what we believed were the character defining features of the home. And the corner feature impacts the perimeter wall. A portion of the perimeter wall would need to be removed in order to put this entry feature in. The perimeter wall is not identified as a character defining feature of the site. In the original staff reports that the Goodlow residence was considered under, it was talked about that the perimeter wall was probably from the period of significance, but that had not been well maintained or was not in good condition. So when we evaluated this, again, we recognize that the proposal is altering the site. There's no question about that, we're not arguing that. What we're saying is that the proposed alterations do not materially impair the character defining features of the site. And that's the distinction on this particular application that's before you. If the work that was being done uh, was to enclose the front porch or open a breezeway uh, or remove a portion or add a portion, you would want to carefully consider whether those types of proposals would materially impair the character defining features of this site. And our findings were that the proposed items that are being uh, uh, requested here uh, do not do that. Yes, they do change the overall uh, configuration and uh, features of the site, but they still respect the importance of the architecture uh, and the overall feeling of the site. With respect to the landscape, the city does not have a landscape ordinance other than we have a water efficient landscape ordinance. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's hard for us to understand unless we've got photographs to show it. Um, you know, most of our desert floor was barren with creosote and you know a few scrub bushes and so on. So in 1934, in the early 1930s, when this tract was subdivided and the land sold off and buildings constructed, certainly this was pretty open space with not many trees and not much shrubbery. Today, 90 years later or more, we see mature plant material. But I don't think that the proposed scope of work, uh, again, damages that part of this um, site, which is historically significant. As it relates to the public's ability to see this historic site, we can only do what we can do with respect to the public's ability to see and understand historic sites. We do have many historic sites that are behind walls and behind shrubs and they cannot be seen by the public. And yet, they still have been granted class one historic site designation. 
So I totally understand and respect your concern about obscuring the views from the public way. But I think that there still are, uh, there still is the ability to see the home, to understand its overall exterior and its vernacular architecture, and that the um, proposed work that is being um, requested by the applicants is not unreasonable. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Lyon. Uh, Mr. Nelson, um, another question, um, Mr. Lyon. <laughs> Quickly respond to that. Um, thank you for that. I understand. I appreciate where you're coming from, and absolutely, it all makes sense. Uh, no question. Um, I would just maybe um, it doesn't hurt to just ask the owner to possibly consider that back in the day when people did have bougainvillea, it would grow over a low wall and kind of cascade and tumble over, and that is part of the association of feeling of uh, that kind of a uh, Adobe bungalow style home. The way it is now, the the uh, bougainvillea reef is a very tall hedge and it's very severely pruned, which is more along the lines of what you might do with a ficus hedge. So just throwing that out there, um, just so you know, there are old postcards that show how it used to look, but uh, I digress. <laughs> okay. Any other questions um, uh, for staff? Are there any other questions, anyone? So, um, so I want to thank the homeowners for uh, providing us with a, a wonderful, uh, very understandable uh, presentation uh, on what they are proposing. I uh, want to thank you for um, making it so easy for us to understand. And now I would like to welcome and invite uh, any comments that you would like to have. Hi, all. Um, we are the property owners, Paul McCauley and Michael Martin. And we really just wanted to check in with everybody to fill any questions that you guys may have. Uh, we appreciate your diligence, especially seeing one of these meetings for the first time ever. And a lot of hard work goes into it. So thank you uh, on behalf of everybody. And now we can say we've been just watched uh, a board meeting, but uh, yeah, thank you much. Um, in respect to what's being discussed, um, I just wanted to note that yes, that is our general feeling with regards to the Bougavia Hedge. And also wanted to just call out, and so there wasn't any confusion, that the addition of a corner entrance would not in any way take away from the existing entrance already on South Indian Trail. So it's actually an additional entrance, which may provide um, more vantage points of the house. That's actually the intent. If you take a look at some of the drawings with the gates, it's actually to, to be able to see through that gate and have a better approach point. You know, we do get passerbys and we do have a little you lose and we invite that. We enjoy that and we have conversations with those if we're out front and they, they engage us and we engage them and, and we're proud of that. And um, we actually think that this is an additional opportunity to uh, take in Casa Bon Pedro. So hopefully that's understood. This is an additional opportunity to see the home. Thank you for that insight. Are there any questions uh, for the applicants? Anyone wish to ask another question? I don't have any questions, but I'd just like to thank them for hanging out with us for these last three hours. I know this was a, a long meeting, so I, I, I actually am fine with these plans. Thank you. So, uh, <laughs> other I would just like to say that I think it looks beautiful. I think it's going to be a great addition to the property. And Thank you for taking care of the property. Thank you. Thank you. So any other, uh, Mr. Lyon? Paul, do you want to explain the significance of the columns at the entrance being different? <laughs> I think Ken gets a kick out of this and it's obviously hard to digest in a seated Zoom uh, perspective, but you'll notice that the two columns that we have proposed are slightly incongruous or different in heights and they would directly be slightly different in widths, uh, one being six eight because that is my height, and one being six foot because that is Michael's height. So it's our sort of nod to ourself here, uh, theoretically on the property line. It's sort of our welcoming to uh, Casablanca Adobe, but that's insider trading. So we'll keep that here for now. Secret secrets. So if there are no other uh, further merit discussions, uh, may I have uh, Jay, Mr. Nelson? You again. Not really uh, a question, but just a comment. 
if it hadn't been done, this is the best homeowner application we've ever received. For <laughs> the most thorough, I mean, the most diagrams, the most paint samples, the most drawings. So you are to be commended for that. And thank you for putting up with everything else. <laughs> thank you all. And thank you, Ken, for really helping to, um, sure. to, to allow us to bring this to you guys. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, may I have a motion? I move that we grant a certificate of appropriateness and direct staff to make the changes in the archival file for the site. Okay, we have a motion. May I have a second? I'll second. So, um, Mrs. Dixon made the motion, and Mr. Rose now did a second on that. And so, is there any uh, further discussion uh, regarding the motions? Okay. So now we'll, we'll call for the vote. So all those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? No, opposed. Okay, so the motion passes uh, uh, four to four. Thank you very much uh, for, uh, for, you, for this presentation. We loved it, as you, as you can tell. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. So, so let us proceed to, um, to discussions on the annual work plan for uh, 2000-2021. Uh, may we have a, a staff report, please? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. As you know, at your September meeting, uh, we brought to you the priorities list that the board had uh, enumerated in the survey that you sent back to me uh, through the month of August. And in your packet is a single page memo from me which identifies uh, the prioritization that you, were, you all gave to these various candidate sites. And so your, your question today on this is, do you want to identify any of these as your work plan priorities for the fiscal year 2021? And if so, do you want to do them in the order of prioritization that you guys create? Board, how would you like to proceed? I would like to go ahead and proceed with exactly the way that the staff report directed. The order of preference. Yep. I agree with that. Okay. Any other uh, questions, um, discussions, or comments about that plan? Okay. So now we'll go on to agenda item. Uh, Why don't we, I'm uh, sorry, Madam Chair. Why don't we do this as a, a quick formal action or in the form of a motion? Okay. So accept this as your work plan. Okay. So uh, may we have a motion? Motion. Okay, Mr. Rose now, oh. make the motion to- uh, I, so, I so move to adopt this plan. Okay. And second. Second. second, Dixon. Okay, motion made by Rose now and second by uh, Dixon to pr proceed with, with the plan as noted. So any further discussion about that? Okay, we'll take the vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All in favor, we are passing this motion four to four. So the next item is uh, 4B, 5B, excuse me, 5B conference planning. Uh, fast forward, designing the future of Palm Springs. Wow, this is coming up. So uh, Dick, Kirkett and his uh, very uh, committed and talented experts have developed an extensive um, online experience uh, for the Paul Fall Preview Modernism Week with streaming will begin on October 15th. That's like next week, isn't it? The program is dis uh, described and stream tickets uh, will be available uh, from Modernism Week uh, website. Uh, the program, um, you can kind of watch it at your own pace uh, beginning on that date and there's three segments. 
two hours each. Um, it's very exciting and, and, and they've worked really hard all over all summer long working hard meetings 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 so we have to thank dick and his wonderful committee uh for putting together uh this really great uh conference uh, planning it's very exciting so does anyone have any comments they'd like to add to that or any questions um uh about that okay so next board member comments does anyone have any comments? I'd like to invite uh, uh, Mrs. Dixon. I would just like to say, Dick, if you're watching us tonight, get well quick. Our thoughts are with you and take care of yourself and come back soon. Ditto, ditto. Great. Mr. Nelson. Ditto to that as well. Um, and just to thank you all for all of your patience. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you owe us. I think we got through it, and I think it was the right discussion to have. And um, I'm glad that we had it tonight and we didn't postpone. It was the right thing to do. I think we all felt it in our gut. Um, the only other comment I have to make very quickly is that I have done some research on Dorothy Goodlaw, which Ken Lyon asked me to do, and I will be sending that research to him uh, privately at some time before the next meeting just so uh, it's part of the uh, archival file. Thank you, Jane. You're welcome. And I'd like to add, this has been a really great meeting and I appreciate all your thoughtful uh, uh, participation and, and, and compelling passion in, in historical um, resources for Palm Springs. And now staff comments. May we have um, Mr. Lyon? My only uh, question for the board is, if you will look at the very bottom of your agenda today, you will see that it's recommending that you adjourn to a date certain of Wednesday, November 4th. Your November meeting uh, falls on Tuesday, uh, November 3rd, which is election day. And we assumed that most people would not want to be doing HSPB work on election day. So we've proposed that your November meeting be shifted to Wednesday, November 4th. And if that works for all of you, uh, just let us know and we will plan on moving the agenda forward in that way. Okay. Uh, any, any other comments or questions before we adjourn? I've said way too much. <laughs> well, it's uh, been three hours and eight minutes, and now it's time to adjourn. Uh, the Historic Site Preservation Board uh, will adjourn to its regularly scheduled meeting on Wednesday, November 4, 2020, at 5.30 p.m., and we'll see you then. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Okie dokie.